My name is Pimp Daddy Supreme. As you know, this show uh, covers mashup culture. It's kind of a deep dive into the last 20 years of uh, mashups, the events, the people, the the music, all of that, but with a specific focus on the producers who helped uh, make this uh, musical style a global phenomenon for over 20 years. Uh, today's guest uh, is a stalwart of uh, San Francisco. He is a hometown hero. His name is Chris Fox. Now, uh, there's a little confusion because a lot of people know him uh, because of the booty mashup charts as Chris as DJ Fox. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of why uh, he has chosen to go by Fox Sounds, which is actually something he's always gone by. Uh, like I said, all will be revealed in the interview, but we're talking about someone who has been mashing things up since 2005, who has hundreds of mashups available for free on his website, uh, foxsounds.net. Uh, I suggest you go there now and start downloading them as we are discussing this because uh, you're going to need some of this. It's classy, it's sexy, it's R&B and neo-soul mixed with rock and roll. It's uh, some good stuff, hence why he's here today on Masters of MASH. Let's just go ahead and get into it. Uh, hey, Chris, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. So once again, uh, just, just before we get into the whole thing, I'm going to do something I normally don't do, because generally you just start off with when you were born. But... Uh, Let's talk just for a second about how Fox Sounds came about. Uh, this was just a friend's idea. You know, I was trying to trying to get a website going, um, just something to host my mashups for free. And just that was basically the main idea. And I have, a, you know, several creative friends. And then I was just, we were brainstorming. And one of them said, how about Fox Sounds? And I was like, I kind of like it. And at that time when I search for anybody else using that name it, the only thing that came up was an actual website of um calls if you're fox, <laughs> right. fox sounds so if you're anyway so i just you know grasped onto that and i never really identified as fox sounds as a dj but it's starting to make more and more sense as i go just because there are a lot of dj foxes and many of which don't have the luxury of having this actual last name right chris fox so, Chris Fox is my name. So that's also how I get billed sometimes. I don't even know anymore. As long as some sort of incarnation is on the flyer, then I'm good. Well, I think that that kind of speaks to how humble you are as a DJ, is that you're really in this for the music and you're not in it for a lot of accolades. It's just something that comes natural. But we'll we'll get into that. Let's talk about who Chris Fox is. Um, when and where were you born? Uh, I was born in 1981 in Greenwich, Connecticut. That's where my family was from uh, originally. And then um, we moved out here when I was eight and uh, out to California, that is. So I'm based in San Francisco now, and that's where I, you know, grew up. That's where I really felt like I became, you know, who I am, the influences that I, that have all gone into the music I like, you know. So uh, the Bay Area, known for Grateful Dead, and that whole psychedelic scene. So I really identify with that. And my, my sister and mom were, you know, into that stuff. And that's a big influence. And then there's also when I grew up in the 90s was a, a really prolific time for Bay Area hip hop, too. So those two influences really describe kind of like the far ends of the spectrum that my influence comes from, which is jam bands, rock, you know, funk. And then eventually hip hop and uh, West Coast funk in particular, where they just got that that clap that just sounds like you're getting slapped across the face. Yeah, can't get enough of that. So you know, groups like Zap and like that kind of stuff that was really heavily uh, heavy influences on artists like Dr. Dre. You know, and I learned that all retroactively, where it's like, why do I love these beats so much? Oh, it's because it's Parliament. You know, and things like that. So that's kind of uh, that's where I'm coming from. Connecticut um, to San Francisco. So when you were in Connecticut, uh, you have an older sister, correct? That's right. And then a younger brother? Um, well, my dad was remarried, so he's technically um, half brother and half sister, but we all kind of grew up, you know, we're very close, so we don't refer to it like that. But, did but um, my, my sister, who's older, was my main sibling. She's the one that came out to California 
Uh, my my mom, sister, and I were the ones that moved out here. Just the three of us. Can you tell me a little bit about like even in those early days of like Connecticut, like maybe some of the music that your parents used to play around the house or things. That- so I mean, my mom had off the wall on on vinyl, you know, and that was kind of like that really set the course. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it was. That was just a family favorite album. And we just, I loved everything about that album. And the more I research it, the more I realize how many moving parts there were to it. And it's Quincy Jones, you know, and Michael Jackson is uh, incredibly awesome. Um, But then you have all these amazing musicians on there too. Um, Like, you know, Brothers Johnson and all these major, major 70s artists that uh, really created, created that tapestry of sound. On the other hand, I had my older sister who's seven years older with her finger really on the pulse of like 80s music at that time. So I was like a seven-year-old kid and then you had a 14-year-old high school girl listening to, um, you know, It Takes Two by Eric B. and Rakim, which I would say she loved that song so much. There was about a four or five week period. That was the only thing coming out from behind that locked door. And I was just like, what is this? You know, and of course, later I'd learn that it was a sample of James Brown and Lynn Collins, which is like, you know, yeah. probably one James Brown, one of my top artists, uh, writers of all time, just his band. I mean, it could go on about him. Um, so she was a, a silent influence on me too, you know, even though it was like the older sister and um, just kind of all these things. And then of course my true love at the heart of it all is Weird Al. And, uh, <laughs> and his take on everything. And to be honest, I learned about a lot of songs listening to Weird Al. Like, I didn't know that I Lost on Jeopardy was, you know, Jeopardy, which is a, you know, I I just learned about a lot of songs that I didn't know about through his parodies, which is kind of its own funny thing. And, you know, that also like that goofball charisma is something uh, I strive for. And, you know, just taking things lightly and not taking things too seriously, being, uh, having having a good time with the music, mainly. It's it's so funny uh, over the course of doing these interviews for Masters of the Mash how often Weird Al Yankovic comes up in these talks. Uh, maybe maybe can you bring any insight as to why you think that is? I don't know. I think it's just he's so versatile. And everything is on limits to him, and that's how I try. And I think Booty too is approach making mashups and playing mashups is anything goes. You know, it's all music and it all matters. So how can you just take any any old song and like make it into something new? And I mean, in his case, he's turning it into comedy. In our case, you know, booty mashup. There are a lot of tongue in cheek mashups. I think that's one of the appeals is like these lyrics that, you know, lyrics and songs and content that wouldn't normally go together. You're like, wait a second. Not only does this go together, but it's extremely clever. You know, um, puns with the names when you make mashups and I don't know, I think it's just sort of lends itself to the lightheartedness and, you know, just we're making these just to party. Let's have a good time. You know, at the root of it all, we're taking other people's music and manipulating it and having a good time with it. And that's what Weird Al does. You know, I didn't think about that, but it is, yeah, it's a major influence. That's, that's amazing. That's, that's his whole, like his whole aesthetic and it's just kind of, um, yeah, it's cool. So when you were when you were younger, I mean, it wasn't just that you were listening to music. You were also taking music lessons, right? I was always a guitarist. Um, I think for my eighth birthday, I got a guitar and started taking lessons the next year. Um, and you know, I took lessons for a few years. And I feel like still still quite competent with the guitar and a bass, you know. But I, I was drawn more towards the bass in the end because of the style I like, which is you know, kind of like meters, like just really funky riffs. You know, I'm not much of a soloist. I really like riffs and just sort of like funk. You know, I've always been drawn towards that. And even like the metal I was listening to and, and the rock, you know, I was really into rock as a kid. It turns out that all the stuff I was listening to, like Pantera and stuff, it's called, you know, groove metal, where it's like they really slowed that down and there really is sort of um, almost a, a hip hop element to that. And I know that might be like, blasphemous but it's true you know it wasn't thrash metal it was more slow and they were just you could really they were dirty grooves and then that's when they started tune you know drop tuning which gives all that metal and grunge its its whole identity is like dropping that e string to e um 
these are all things I've kind of learned retroactively. Like once I've, you know, and I think I was saying before we had our technical problem about this show I watched called What Makes This Song Great by this guy, Rick Beato, who's like a producer from the 90s, B-E-A-T-O. He's based out of Atlanta. And he's got like over 90 of these episodes on his YouTube channel. And he just goes through the songs, all sorts of songs. I mean, the full range of styles, eras. He does one this and carry on Wayward Son. He's doing, uh, he does have one about Pantera, uh, Nirvana, you know, a lot of 90 stuff. But he's just describing kind of like what it is about the song that makes it sound good. And it's like, confirmations of things that I've thought and I'm sure other people where it's like, oh, there's something about that guitar that just I love. And he will illustrate that and be like, here's how they made that sound. And it's like, but then they layer this vocal over it that you can barely hear, but it's there. And now that you've heard it that way, you can't unhear it. So, and then he went through, there was a thing where he's talking about groove metal. And I'm like, that was a whole thing. And that, you know, paved the way for new metal wasn't as much into but you know bands like Slipknot and stuff is kind of where I started to lose a little bit of interest in that genre yeah but at the same time I was getting way more into hip-hop and the styles that are incorporated by that which I realized in the end what I'm drawn to is just grooves funk you know and space in that song and anyway yeah no was it uh listening to a lot of your stuff it's it's really interesting to again you're all about that groove you're all about kind of like the kind of the feels and and it probably speaks also to the fact that you know you've you've been a dj in so many bars um that you have to create this vibe that is meant to not only get people dancing but also make them relaxed and kind of chill and so you have, like, I spent a good number of years doing, like, you know, uh, a good number of, like, black clubs here in Nashville, uh, primarily black clubs in Nashville. And it's like, you know, doing neo soul nights and stuff like that. It's like you have that R&B, like, really, like, kind of grown and sexy kind of, like, vibe uh, to a lot of your work and mashups. It's one of the things that I think makes your catalog of mashups really stand out is that while you know most most artists are going for that super extreme genre clash or like rock forward um or or party pumpers you know fist pumpers like you really have this really nice roller coaster you've got stuff that's up tempo that's you know ready for the party but a lot of your stuff is right there in that mid tempo range that uh that really evokes kind of that real pleasant smile you know yeah, that's my favorite. I think what um, what I had said, I didn't even really make it this way, but it makes a lot of sense. When I was interviewed by Adriana for Mashup Talk about a month or two ago, is that my favorite area of music, tempo-wise and vibe-wise, is post-foot tapping, pre-fist pump. <laughs> so it's, it's a little more energy than when you just got to the party. So it's right then when you've had a couple drinks and you're starting to move, you know, without even under, understanding why. You just have this kind of vibe flowing through your body and it's, you know, you're now standing up. You're not necessarily sitting, but if you are, you're, you're dancing in your seat. And that, for some reason, I just love that vibe. And uh, that's why I've been drawn a lot um, to the lounge type places, you know, not as much like a really cracking bar. And, you know, I'm happy to do that set too uh, but you know for example booty for years like my specialty has kind of been that back room that's what i love is kind of the alternative to what's going on out front and out front too and out front i'm referring to the main dance room where you can fit a thousand people and i mean i'm always kind of into counter programming like how can i provide something just a little bit different in this room and you know no worries if you want to be out in that front room i just like providing somewhat of an alternative and that goes for some of the bars i'll work at where across the street we have like a ratchet hip-hop club so i'll play old school soul or neo soul to give an alternative for somebody other people on that block to do something different and maybe people do want two ratchet hip-hop clubs but they're gonna to have to open another club and hire someone else to do that because i just sort of enjoy yeah that loungy vibe 
Yeah. Uh, and you know, at any moment, I could take it and make people dance. But I just love that little middle area, and that's been a major influence on my my mashups and blends and and edits and stuff that I've made. So that's just what to me. And uh, you know, it's I guess I've just made enough now where if you look at it cumulatively, that is generally the vibe you're gonna get. Yeah. And with the occasional occasional fist pumper. I think it's I think it's fantastic, and and again, I think it serves a lot more of the mashup DJ audience uh, when they're trying to fill out their sets with tracks uh, that aren't just 128 BPM all night long. Like you know, as a DJ personally, I like to take my listeners uh, on a trip. And again, I always I always evoke the roller coaster because it's like there are times when you want them out there on that floor, you know, dancing their their ass off. And if you've ever been in a bar setting or a club setting, you know that you know you can only have them out there dancing for so long because you have to push them to the bar to go get drinks, you know, yep. and you have to bring it down. And while you bring it down, you also don't want to lose the people that already have their drinks. So it's like right. you so really have to weave path. everything together. I know you know that and do that well. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been you wouldn't be DJing for fifteen plus years, you know, in San Francisco and running with as many crews as you're running with. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, let's let's fill out a little bit more of your uh, your history as as a, as a youngster. Um, you moved when you you said eighth grade or eight years old. Uh, no, eight years old. Eight years old. Yeah. And uh, at that point, like, were you doing any kind of like? Uh, messing around with audio as far as like, you know, between before the age of 15, you know, like. Yeah. So very early on, and we didn't actually talk about this the other night, but this is, this is worth noting. A player, cassette player with two cassettes and the recording function was broken on the, on the second deck. So when you recorded something, it would record outside no, noise as the cassette playing in the first. So I started multi-tracking myself at age 11. So I would play the guitar and then I'd put that tape in the first deck and record on the next one and play over that. So I was doing like three part guitars, even three, four part harmonies, you know, singing, just a little kid doing this in my room. And I mean, you know, that was the first time I was like, this is great. This was really fun. Um, so yeah, I've been toying with that idea forever. And so, you know, I'm more less of an improvisational guitarist, but what I would be able to do is, for example, you know, Beatles huge influence especially as a kid we always had Beatles albums going on on the you know my mom's record player or whatever same with my dad I'd say influence as far as their you know harmonies and just their layering of stuff so I would sit there and analyze Beatles songs and then I'd go through and recreate you know on John's harmonies with my broken tape player kept it to myself for the most part but it turns out you know that, that was something I was just so drawn to. Nobody showed me how to do this. It was just like a thing. And I was like, cool. So yeah. I kept that, you know, I wish I still had that broken tape player as a relic, but thank God it was broken, you know, because uh, <laughs> it was pretty funny how it worked out. I've been toying with music like that forever. Now you say that you kept your music to yourself, but when you were in, in school, you were like pretty active in sports, right? I was, yeah, I was active in sports. Music was just sort of my personal hobby, and I, I jammed with some people here and there. But um, once I hit high school, you know, I really craved that kind of team aspect, people, and having that support. Um, so I, I was really, really drawn towards group sports, you know, and that really shaped the next four years. Was like music took a back seat, sadly. But I have no regrets, you know, and I, and I loved every moment I played on those teams and I played lacrosse and hockey and even a little soccer and uh, really, really, you know, enjoy that, you know, being active and exercise is still a very important balance to my life, you know, because of the amount of times, the amount of time I spend in loud, hot environments with a lot of alcohol flowing around me. I need to offset that with like exercise. And so that's always the thing. Um, you know, that I feel like is equally part of the equation is, you know, your, your physical and mental health. Yeah. As far as, you know, cause it's, it's easy to just fall into a routine in the nightlife scene where you're just, you know, doing too much stuff every night, uh, staying up too late and not balancing that out with, you know, health. 
So that's always been a main, a, a really major thing for me. Yeah, even to the point where now, now that you know all the clubs are shut down and whatnot, you're doing a lot of stuff on Twitch on your own channel right now, which again is streaming, yeah. Twitch Twitch TV forward slash Fox Sounds, right? Sounds and you know really represents the fact that I'm really doing this for myself. You know, it turns out I love DJing, even if it's for a bunch of strangers on the internet. I really just enjoy the feeling I get from mixing two songs together. Maybe shouldn't go, or they go so well that you can't even tell when one ends and one begins. Um, and also it's given me a chance to go through the 10,000 records I'm sitting on during quarantine and find stuff I forgot I had. And also to really showcase the diversity in one place for people because you know, especially other DJs, we're all working all the time. So you can't attend your friend's shows who are DJs. You just see people who I'm, I know they're good, but I've never heard them play until like quarantine, where it's like everybody has their Twitch channel now and you can really watch people and be like, this guy is really good. Or this guy is not as good as he says he is. Or Right. So it's just, it's really given a window and, you know, created these really unlikely in Twitch because, you know, I mean, I feel like we're friends now. We were introduced through a booty message thread on Twitch when everybody was sorting out how to use OBS and like, you know, I feel like there was a value in this. Um, and if you told me four months ago, I would be, you know, my main social interaction was in a chat room on a gaming platform, I probably would have slapped you. You know, and, and, and really, but that is satisfying. And that's the closest thing that we have right now to basically being at a bar. So a group of DJ homies will watch another guy and we'll you know each other in the chat room and be like, hey, man, miss you, bud. And I mean, it, that same sort of release that, that you get when you see a friend, it's not the same. You can't hug them, but it's giving us a real time form of interacting. Yeah. Now, I wanted to bring that back to your your channel. You were saying that you were really into exercise. You've got a new show that you're looking to put together called Sit and Spin. You want to tell me about that? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess before I got sidetracked, what Twitch has helped me realize is just really like I'm a kitchen CJ. So one of the first streams I did was like Electro Swing and Jazzy Fox and that whole project. The next one was Booty. Then the next one, I was playing a Motown Monday. So for the first 12 weeks of quarantine, we were streaming Motown on Mondays out of a club, which had, was one of the first places to set a Twitch and webcam properly. You know, and it was really good. The, the sound was linked up. They had three angles. And at that point, we didn't even know what to do. I didn't know how to stream. Um, but I ended up, you know, thanks to our, our good friend Micah, who runs uh, different great things here in San Francisco. What an influential art artist, um, Micah Burns. He's one of the managers, um, the manager of Monarch and Great Northern, and they have a huge variety of artists. And for the first 12 weeks of quarantine, basically, till everybody else figured out how to stream, he was in like five to six nights a week of all these different residents that play at that club, Monarch. So I was basically learning the ropes as I went and looking at it like basically an unplanned internship of how to do this myself. And he knew that that was going to happen. Eventually, we're all going to set up our own thing and figure out how to do this. And we did. I started to really look at my webcam more and chit chat a little and realize that people crave that sort of, you know, and I do too. When I'm watching a DJ, I'm like, this guy's boring. You know, if he is, and it's like, it's, it's to really take that sort of approach to it more and be a little more interactive and a little more fun, a little more, a little more motion going on because as a viewer and a dancer, you want that. And so what that's led me to create is, uh, and thanks to Booty for hosting this dance, um, what is it? Um, dance Commander dance, Disco. Dance Commander Disco. And so Ramey, you know, and Random Acts of a Reverence out of LA, what we'll do now is post, you know, we'll stream booty, but we have a whole scene with this, which is just the Zoom call. And I realized, you know, there is the Zoom parties. I mean, that's the thing. I've played a bunch of tunes for, for people. I couldn't even see because that was actually a Vimeo call. So I wasn't even in on the call. I just had to trust that uh, I was doing the right thing. 
All right, back again with Masters of MASH here with Fox Sounds, a.k.a. DJ Fox. We've had a round of storms here in Nashville, Tennessee that have uh, caused our uh, all sorts of problems. And then, of course, uh, you know, there's been some uh, Twitch issues over the last week. I know Lobster Dust was having an overheating problem with his computer. It's just not a good week for, uh, for streaming, <laughs> obviously. Uh, for those of you watching the replay of this later, uh, we are based off of Twitch. It's a gaming uh, streaming platform uh, that allows uh, for real-time interaction with the audience. And uh, you know, you might you may be watching this on YouTube because videos uh, once they expire in the archive go to my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash pimp daddy supreme. Uh, in the meantime, uh, looks like we're we're good. Uh, Somebody said y'all are too cute, so I'm going to take that as a yes. Uh, All right, that's good. I'll tell you right now, uh, you were in the West Coast going to high school. You went to like a, a, a college prep, right? Yeah, there was a, there's a school here in San Francisco that's like, um, you know, it's just a really good school. And uh, I, was, I was thankful to get into it. You had to apply, you know, is that whole thing. And. They had great sports teams and just a really, really diverse student body. Um, so that was a that was just incomparable experience. And I'm still like I still hook, you know, help out with school functions. I just did their auction last year. They do a father's club auction, and these people are raising like a ton of money, and it all goes towards financial aid. Which for a kid like me, like I, I was on financial aid at this school. It's not cheap. So yeah, and 25 percent of their student body are on financial aid. So those types of events are what allowed a kid like me to go to that school. And so now on the other end, I'm like, you know, donating my DJ skills to their event. And it's just, it's cool. You know, I end up just um, donating whatever it is they would pay me to that student financial aid fund. And, you know, that there was a Jesuit school. So it was just kind of like a very, very good education and are very good. Um, they just really instilled some solid values, you know, it was very, very important to me. And that made it, you know, so that when I went to college, it was a little, it was even easier than high school because high school was hard. I got to college where there's nobody bugging you. It's just, you either go to class and you, you fail or you pass. Right. Nobody gives a shit. The teachers don't care. They're just like, all right, we're not going to like try to motivate you. So many people. So that really helped me, you know, once I got to college, like, uh, do better in school than my counterparts who didn't have that kind of prep for that. And that would just, it just helped me because I had a hard time uh, focusing. Yeah. And you, you said that, you know, you're there on a scholarship. Your mom worked for a neon sign company. I originally worked for a neon sign company, which was cool. Like just in the heart of San Francisco, she was sort of like a sales person for that. But you know, the, the company itself had glass blowers, designers, artists you know and it was just fascinating to me to see that and it was fascinating to her too and then she started a catering company after uh she left that job right which but was, as a kid did this mean that you you had neon in your bedroom actually i did at one point my birthday present was a neon sign that said chris that's awesome so that pretty cool yeah um yeah that was cool that was cool <laughs> but your mom got into catering and and did pretty well right she started a catering company and did great. She ran that company for like 25 years. And she she just kind of stopped doing it uh, not that long ago. And she still does catering lessons, but it was through her that I really was, got uh, insight into like events, you know, and then I started doing those myself, but just the musical side. But, um, you know, thanks to years of helping her with her catering company, I had like sort of a, just a, a good approach to how to, how to, behave and act at events, you know, and treat that client like they're the most important person in the world. And hospitality, you know, has sort of always been a, an underlying theme. I was a server at restaurants. I was, you know, helped run the front of the house for my mom's catering company, all while being very interested in music. And it wasn't until I was in my mid-20s that I really sort of put the two together. Yeah, you were um, saying uh, when we had talked previously that uh – this actually kind of ties into part of your uh, DJ origin story. That's right. Just seeing, um, seeing these DJs at events, you know, we did a lot of weddings and I was at that time, 
you know, all vinyl, snob DJ, like, and, you know, since then, of course, I'm a huge vinyl enthusiast, but that doesn't mean that uh, it's superior to any other format. You know, that's just what I right. like. But at that time, I was like, huh, anyone that doesn't play vinyl isn't a real DJ, which is absolute BS, of course. But at that time, I was like, I would never do a wedding. These guys are cheesy. And uh, but once I found out how much they made, I was like, maybe there is a window here for me to sneak in. And, you know, I was talking to my mom about it, who's just a huge influence as far as like having the confidence to start your own company and do your own thing and be sort of a trailblazer and not answer to anybody else and be your own boss. She solely is responsible for like that direction, giving me that just zeal for like, all right, let's make this happen, you know, and um, nothing against my dad either. He's very supportive, but he's a salesman, you know, and, and that's just been his experience. And. He was um, suggesting I do that, and I think I could probably do that too. But I just really had this passion for working for myself and uh, setting my own schedule. And I have a rapport with clients that, you know, that's a reason I've been doing that for so long. I feel it's like a, I'm very genuine to it, and I'm not like a cheese ball on the mic. It's just sort of like I, I make those announcements that need to be said, but in a very classy, non cheesy way. And that was what I my approach to getting into the weddings and private events game was like, I could do this, but I don't have to act or dress like this guy who's wearing a zoot suit and trying to tell jokes. Right. You know, let's just like be the cool, classy, you know, I call it, you know, sonic wallpaper almost. You're just like providing a backdrop that hopefully some people don't even notice, you know, it's, until they get to the dance party. But, you know, sometimes I just like to be in the background. Yeah. And, and, and it, again, when we talk about like, you know, Twitch or bars, either high energy or like, you know, like lounge kind of places, it's like being able to switch as a DJ from being knowing when to lay back and let, you know, people experience the music as part of a whole thing or whether to be provide the show is is part of like you know what we do it's like you know there are times when you want to grab that mic and you want to hype people up and you want to get them to fist pump and then there's other times where it's like your whole goal is to put a song on to make that one person at the bar walk out on the dance floor and then know the right next song to get the other person uh that might want to go home with that person out on the dance floor and then the song that gets those two people to go home together right, right. you know it's kind of like a, yeah. a like a, a shaman kind of like level like you know, you know, you yeah. know the right combination, the Konami code of of songs, to you know make the you know that thing happen, that magic happen. There's certainly a flow to it, and that takes time um, to understand the finesse of that. You know, um, and sometimes you either get it or you don't. I guess it's kind of like sometimes you guess wrong, and that's okay too. That's sort of like the learning process of you know honing your taste and you know, finessing that mixing skill, of knowing what song to play and when, and just sort of being in tune to that mood. And so that's sort of one of my selling points when I'm like, yeah, I'll do your wedding or your event. I'm just constantly scanning that room, you know, every 30 seconds to see what's going on and the subtleties of that. Are people dancing like this or are they dancing like this or do they have their hands in their pockets, you know, and which one is it and where are people at? So yeah. That's what I was kind of saying about pre-foot tapping or pre-fist pumping, post-foot tapping is like understanding when people are in the foot tapping mood. They're just talking. They're just arriving. And then when have they had a couple of cocktails? When are they starting to get loose? And just completely understanding what you're watching. Yeah. And playing the appropriate music for Yeah, it. you don't play 2, a, 2 a.m. banger is at like 6 p.m., you know? No, or 2 live crew. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Save that for later. Uh, maybe you play some Lauren Hill at 6 p.m. Yeah, war warm them up first. Yeah, it's it's very yeah. very much a romance for sure. Uh, now, like, I'm we've talked a lot about like you know your your DJing style and like uh you know some of the sound and like just the technicalities of DJing in general. But let's talk more toward this origin of Fox Sounds and towards you as a DJ and mashup producer. Uh, it wasn't until college that uh you even got into the i guess what would you call it pre-djing you you joined a fraternity uh you yeah. you're the the oh uh, gosh oh. what was it it was sigma what was your 
Alpha Epsilon. Yeah, I mean, so let me preface that with saying, like, I've never identified as a frat guy, you know, and I had a pre, I had a prejudice towards that whole scene before, you know, I'm like, that's not me. I'm more into like, you know, well, I guess independent thought and not buying your friends, which is how some people could see that. Yeah. But I'm also a survivalist. Um, you know, so I, when I went out to New Hampshire for college, which is where my dad lives, so I got in-state fees. We just told the school that I lived there. So they thought I was a resident of New Hampshire, but they didn't, you know, I wasn't. But I went out there, didn't know a single person. That was kind of what I wanted. I like challenges, and I especially like, you know, I guess anthropological challenges, which is let me throw myself into an environment and let's see what happens. <laughs> right. What did happen is I got very swiftly evicted from the dorms for smoking pot. Um, I needed a place to live. And housing was tight at that school, as it is at a lot of schools. And I learned quickly that if I pledged a fraternity, they'd give me a place to live after. So I kind of needed it. And also what drew me to this was um, a very diverse group of guys. It was not your stereotypical fraternity frat guy thing. It was like a series of different kinds of people, including like people that were really into the Grateful Dead, um, you know, and fish and stuff like that, like people that were hardcore into that. And then we had a couple some athletes, you know, and we had like the poli sci guys and it was just a really good range of people and everybody was pretty accepting of each other. And that was very cool to me. And, you know, and, and playing on sports teams, I was drawn to like a group of people and having that support system and especially being from out of state and not having a lot of friends. When I got there, I craved that ended up being the best decision of my life really because of all the lifelong friendships and also the role I took on at that house, which was social chair. So there's all sorts of roles. There's the treasurer, there's the president, you know, vice president and all these different things. And the social chair, obviously a lot of fraternities are known for their parties and that's how we would make money. You know, we would, um, we would charge money at the door, you know, and half of it would go towards a philanthropy fund, you know, and that kept us in good standing with the school. There were all sorts of ways to, make these parties happen, but the social chair was responsible for coming up with the theme of the party. Um, the flyers, you know, I have to make little flyers and print them out and then go give them to the, the hot chicks on campus or whatever, you know, and then um, source the booze, you know, we're underage. So you had to source that booze and we had to get the guy who had the fake ID to come with us or whatever. And then up on top of all that, you were responsible for making the playlist for the party. And that was where I really, really, I was drawn to that. And this was just the Napster days. So what I, I didn't even have a computer. So I would go into like a dorm room of a friend and spend all day in there, sometimes two days, like just downloading music off Napster, which took forever. And then burn CDs out of that, which again, took forever. It would take like 20 minutes a CD. And I would make five CDs for that party. So essentially, I wasn't DJing because I wanted to be at the party after all my hard work. I was programming music, just thinking, all right, this first CD is for that first hour and 20 minutes when people get there. What would I want to hear if I was just showing up to a party? Then the next one is kind of let's start firing it up. And the goal was you don't ever have to skip a song. And inevitably, that would happen because people would find the CD player and try to find songs they wanted. So at that point, I would let go of it, but creating those five CDs and presenting this programming thing for the party uh, shaped what I'm doing today because I got out of school and I was like, you know, I had a communications major and a music minor and, you know, I'd say I use some of that stuff for my life, but most of my life lessons came from those four years um, doing the social chair duties for this fraternity house. And, it, you know, irreplaceable experience um, being there and doing this and getting just decent reactions from the music. Obviously seeing a dance floor full was uh, positive reinforcement for that. I had made the right choices for that time. Um, also based on the uh, diversity of the group that we were with and the people that were coming to these parties, that playlist could be a Grateful Dead. It could be Marvin Gaye. It could be Nelly all in that order. Yeah. And so it was a sort of, you know, Jimmy Buffett. So we put on some real classics there and then we'd keep it current. So we'd I'd offset Jimmy Buffett by putting the current song at that time. 
uh, which I think the best song at that time and really fire up the party was Shaggy, It Wasn't Me. That song, just you couldn't fail. So I had this concept of like there's can't fails, you know, if your party's dying, put this on. Right. Um, just these concepts that have stuck with me to this day where it's like, all right, if you got yourself a dead dance floor and you put on Billie Jean and nothing happens, I'm sorry, but your party's over. Like if you put on like what is, you know, popular dance song that you've seen work a million times and it doesn't work, then, you know, you have to start thinking about what you can do to, at some parties just may not be, they may not ever get to that dance floor. And uh, that's cool too. Sometimes like with these corporate parties, they're not there to dance. They're there to schmooze. Yeah. And so just acknowledging that difference and being like, what's going to work for this. And I just treating every party uniquely. And so uh, when we talk about uh, those early days, you're you're talking about your college days were like 1999 to 2003, and right. probably around was it like maybe let's say 2000 2001 is when you joined the fraternity, right? Yeah, you know, it was two. It was 99. It was the fall semester of my freshman year, right after I had been evicted from the. Dorms. Okay, so immediately. So immediately, I mean, I had to I had to solve a problem pretty quickly, and it was just like there's no housing. I didn't have my car out there. You weren't allowed to have a car on campus. So uh, as a freshman and there, nor, you know, I got evicted from the dorm, so I couldn't live on campus. And there was a very limited number of off campus housing that was within the vicinity of the school. Yeah. And so, yeah, this place needed needed people and they had some extra rooms. Uh, so that was that was the solution. And it ended up being a great thing. I made some lifelong friends that I still keep in touch with today. So yeah. when you were there during this time period is roughly about the same time that the UK mashup scene started and that mashups started like making their way over here into the United States. As a matter of fact, there were even some hip hop DJs, some turntablists that started doing more blend style uh, mashups, but that, that mimicked a lot of what the, the extreme genre clashes that, uh, were happening over in the UK scene as far as mashups were concerned or bootlegs or bastard pop. Now, that being said, were you aware of any of that while you were in college? I wasn't really aware of the UK scene. I, I really, have, you know, was just sort of an insulated, you know, I liked what I liked and I, I didn't have a whole lot of outside influences because, um, you know, the internet was just sort of starting to have its huge reach. Um, but I did have a friend who had a very cool taste in music and was always introducing me to different things. Um, and he, he had that Z trip DJP album on easy listening. And that really changed my life. You know, at that point I was just like, I had this visual, I don't know what it was, just almost like a prejudice. Um, and don't read that as racist, just like, uh, of what a DJ was and what a DJ did. And I just had in my mind, I was like, a DJ is a guy that plays hip hop in a club, you know, and that's just what I associated with it, that or the other extreme, like, you know, house DJs and that kind of stuff. And so when I heard somebody combining all these styles, like especially rock, I'm like, there's no such thing as a rock DJ is what I thought at that time. And then when I heard Z Trip and P putting together, um, you know, I, I think I specifically remember um, Notorious B.I.G. and Pink Floyd being matched up on that album. Now, those were two very important influences for me, artists I really enjoyed. And to hear them mashed up at the same time, I was like, this is what I'm talking about. Like, this is something that I'm interested in. Isn't DJing one style of music or um, just multiple influences? Anything goes. There's no barrier here. You just do whatever feels good. And even if it feels weird, it could be some genius, you know, and, and I felt like that was genius. Um, just a simple A plus B mashup, putting two completely unrelated sources, yet related. You know what I mean? I, uh, Rise by uh, Herb Alpert, the sample from um, Hypnotize, came out in the 70s. I don't even know if it's the same year as Pink Floyd, uh, but it could be. So, you know, those are related almost. It's like disco and then what Pink Floyd was doing. Um, they had definitely a disco element in some of their songs, too. And so even though it's hip hop, uh, you know, it's just music is a huge, big picture and it all correlates. It's a melting pot. It is. And so hearing somebody do that right, I was like, that's that's what I'm trying to do. 
Now that that got you that that piqued your ear, but you still didn't wind up picking up on like because I, I think I tried to talk to you about uh, you're on all of these these uh, uh, like Napster kind of like Audio Galaxy kind of you know download sites, um, but at that point you still weren't downloading mashups or programming them for your parties, right? Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. So it just was not really a thing to me yet. For all I knew, that album was maybe the only of its kind. That so at what point did you become aware uh, of, you know, mashups or people doing what Z Trip was doing, but in a, in a different way? Again, you graduated college in 2003. So Probably I'm assuming... not until a year after that. So I was, um, you know, collecting vinyl and uh, just Back sort in of California? Moved. Yeah, I was back at this point and trying to become a DJ, um, you know, kind of faked it till I made it. Really, I probably had less than 100 records when I started DJing. Now, what you know? got you into vinyl? Um, well, that was um, we had a big party at that house and somebody broke into my room and stole my 2000 CDs that I had spent years collecting, as well as like a video camera. Um, so... I got paid out for insurance and I definitely oh, wow. embellished that insurance quite a bit. And I ended up getting a lot of money, a lot of money for it, 10 K or something. And I just decided to put that money into turntables and a sampler and started collecting vinyl because I just had a adversity to buying CDs twice. You know, so I yeah. had some sort of premonition like CDs aren't going to be around forever. They were so expensive too. You're talking 16 to 20 bucks a disc. And I looked at it like, Oh yeah, that's totally worth it. I had all the Beastie Boys albums, all you know. I was a collector of that, and it was very well organized. So when it got stolen, I was crushed. Man, renter's insurance, right? Renter's insurance. That's great. That's gr that's a good story. That was uh, uh, satisfying, you know, to say the least. And then I just put that money into like, what am I doing next? And so the idea at that point was, I'm going to get a sampler sequencer. And I'm going to start making beats, and I'm going to scratch over those beats. And that was just kind of my setup, was one turntable and a beat machine. And I tried to do that and sort of just, you know, make these beats in my bedroom. And at one point, I lived in an uninsulated attic in a house. That was cool uh, until the winter came. And then I realized it was freezing. Like, you'd put a bottle of water next to the bed, and it would freeze overnight. So I'm surprised uh, some of my machines made it out of that. But... After college, I bought a second turntable. In fact, the, actually, I bought two turntables because the one I had was like a Stanton, which is like not quite as good as a Technique. So right. I bought two Techniques off Craigslist, and they showed up. Uh, you know, I was scammed. I was scammed. Oh. So the turntables were pretty much destroyed, um, you know, so much to the point that when I had to go sign for it at the post office, the post the postal worker who dragged out she dragged a box out of the back room and it looked like it had been through a disaster. It, the corner, I mean, there was like a hole in it. She's like, I hope there's nothing important in here. And I was like, just my dreams, you know? Uh, so <laughs> I ended up trying to pay just as much money as I paid for the turntables to get them fixed. I still have those turntables, which says a lot about the um, durability of Techniques 1200s. Yeah. They are worth it. You can drive a tank over these things. They're you can amazing. Arm with steel, you kick them with boots. Like, so that was cool. Um, and that was a nice little, you know, it was real bummer. And I was totally flat broke. I spent all my money on those turntables only to have to like fix them. And even and then it was no guarantee, but we replaced the tone arm. I mean, we're talking like every major component of this turntable had to be fixed. And I couldn't get him. You know, this was right before PayPal came out. So I even had my lawyer buddy draft an, a fake intent to sue letter. This guy just never responded, and there was nothing we could do. Right. Nothing we could do about it. So that's terrible. Um, I, well, yeah, it was good story followed by a terrible story. Yeah. Let's yeah. Let's talk about this machine that you bought. You bought a the first machine. Was it the Roland SP eight hundred eight EX? Yeah, it's just this blinky trinket, you know, that you can... I've got a picture a, of it in the corner of the screen. Oh, do. Nice. Yeah, so it's this blinky trinket with 16 pad samples, and it's got, like, a sequencer in there, so, you you know, it teaches you... You learn how to program synth sounds, and it's got some cool filters on it. Um, and it also, you know, you can basically... What I was saying before, you can multi-track yourself. So this was the next step 
after the story I was saying, I don't, maybe it was before we got cut off, but the broken cassette player I had as a kid. Oh, right. You, you could record um, not only the cassette in deck A, but also your own voice or whatever you wanted. So you could multi-track yourself. And I was doing that since age 11. Uh, so this was like the natural, this was the digital solution to that. And I mean, it's still quite primitive compared to what you could do today in Ableton and stuff like that, but it still allowed me to be really creative. And then kind of my dream was to then, you know, do cool scratch sounds over those, over those beats, which primarily consisted of like a program bass, me playing like a dubbed out guitar riff, and then some sampled drums from like a hip hop song or whatever. This so is that, your early project, your early, early project called Porn Dub, right? Well, that Porn Dub and, and the sadly, you know, misnamed project, really, and really bad for search results. Um, that was later. So originally, um, and, you know, we didn't even talk about this before, but my first DJ name was Slouche. Was what? And, yeah, exactly. Did you say and, Slouche? Slouche. Okay. And, you know... I'll just be honest about it. It was the name of a bong. It was the name of a bong that we had. And, you know, it's just like, let's just think of a name. I don't want it to be Fox. I want it to be completely weird and mysterious. So that was the name I was making beats under. The only person, the only people that knew I made beats were my friends. You know, I wasn't trying to get these out to people. I just was, it's just, um, it was therapeutic and fun for me. And so yeah. it was a, it was a way to kind of get away, you know, when, a being in that fraternity environment was a little much for me, which it often was. Let's say, you know, I mean, I, I don't really like, I like playing sports. I really don't like watching them. So when everybody was into watching a football game, I would go upstairs and make music in my room. And that was like a sure way to not get bothered. Yeah. And so that was my escape from that super, you know, hyper masculine lifestyle and just, you know, overstimulation was just to get upstairs and be like, I'm just playing guitar and I'm making music in my room for the next. I, I personally hours. really relate to that. I'm not a sports watcher, but I'm a sports player. I totally yeah. get where you're coming from. Yeah. I mean, I like the group interaction of playing sports, but I'm not a real spectator, um, you know, or I'm not that terribly enthusiastic about like, especially football or whatever. Right. Bro and down. So when that game. happened, you know, there are other ways for me to bro down, but just that wasn't it. So that was a major, that would always be a guaranteed Sunday's music day. That's when I would go upstairs and just be in my room by myself. And I could hear shouts and bottles breaking downstairs. And I'd just be like, I'm in my happy place. Um, <laughs> so since you know, we're talking about musical projects and like the birth of like you getting into, you know, making your own beats and own whatever else like that. Tell me a little bit about Jazzy Fox. Yeah, so Jazzy Fox, I mean, this is all sort of, um, you know, after I've been making matchups for a while, I really liked that. But what I really liked is gathering several influences and making making something out of that. So I, didn't, I wouldn't even call Jazzy Fox, which was basically, um, I was turned on to electro swing through a party I was doing. One of the guests said something like, I had just made a song with a Fats Waller, you know, the amazing... 40s um, pianist entertainer. Um, what a what a talented guy. Just anyway, I uh, had heard a song of his. I really liked it. it. Had a nice bounce to it. So I made some production over it, and I did a beat and uh, just kind of chopped up his song to turn it into this bouncy mid tempo vibe. And somebody, when I played it at this party, was like, "Man, this sounds like electro swing." And I was like, "What is that?" This was around 2012, and he was, I had never heard of it. And the genre was very new at that point. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you're basically taking house and, you know, a lot of kind of four to the floor influences a lot of the time. And um, just kind of, it just has a really fun vibe to it. And once I went down that wormhole, I was like, this is something I could be involved in. And what it allowed me to do is take the, the techniques I had been using, which is, you know, elements of songs and combining them together, shamelessly using other people's sources. So, you know, I want people to know I didn't make this beat. But what I learned is that using old familiar beats, but maybe souping them up a little bit, um, that's what gives people a fam instantly familiar aspect. So rather than these esoteric beats I was making, that's like, here, here's something you've never heard in your life. 
it gives you know that those familiar sample beats the drums especially give people something to latch on to like oh i kind of feel like i already know this and so that's what i was doing is uh taking these jazz songs that basically had no drums or low end or if they did it wasn't recorded very well just because of the limited technology and adding adding some hip-hop beats or just familiar things to really emphasize these instrumentalists on these jazz songs and that was very satisfying to me just taking a few different sources and putting it together and it was i'd already been making mashups i'd already made beats this was sort of like how can i have a unique take on all this production and you know make that happen so that was definitely uh surged into high gear when i had shared this with my grandfather who was 90 he's actually 94 tomorrow that reminds me i need to call him um he's a huge collector of music the the fox family is our collectors you know so my father has a lot of records my grandfather taped radio shows off the internet through the 70s and eight or not sorry the internet radio shows off of like his old school radio uh, jazz shows he was a huge jazz man and so he's got cassette after cassette of these radio shows 1400 cassettes each side would be like a show and he took the time to digitize these cassettes with my dad and he gave me this hard drive with gig after gig of jazz so then i would just go through those and find some songs that i'm like this has some potential and just try to hear like oh this is this is really good and there's certain artists that just lend itself to what i considered my sound better like duke ellington uh, Fats Waller, you know, real um, swing, swing where there's a, definitely an up tempo, like dun, 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 dun. Um, and you know, it almost sounds like reggae, some of it, the way it's like this up tempo, kind of in between the beats, you have a. So I was really drawn to that. It makes me happy, you know. A lot of the influences for Jazzy Fox was funky house, my favorite kind of house. Yeah. It's just sort of happy has this up-tempo vibe to it that just makes you want to kind of, it just lifts you up. And again, you can uh, down, you can download some of this Jazzy Fox stuff off of your website, uh, foxsounds.net, um, actually, right? Actually, most of it is on SoundCloud. So SoundCloud slash Jazzy Fox is where most of that, actually all of it. So there's essentially three, three albums worth of material. Um, I've been, I've had sort of a writer's block for the last two years. It just sort of, it was a nice five, you know, three year burst. And, and that was a time where I was heavily involved in this um, Bay Area electro swing scene, which is, you know, was thriving at a point. It's sort of like still has a great vibe. There are a lot of supporters of it. Personally, um, you know, I've, I've delved back into sort of mashups. You know, I almost took a, a couple of years off of making mashups because I was so entrenched in my Jazzy Fox project. And I loved that, but I started to find myself doing more uh, pop parties again. And, well, you were you, know, you were also delving a lot into the past with gr groups like Motown on Mondays. Yeah, and I mean that's that's proven to be like a, a really long lasting uh, partnership. There is uh, I started doing, you know, just basically whenever I've made mashups, it goes through whatever it is I'm involved in at that moment, sort of. So there was a time when I started to get involved with Motown Mondays around 2011. And that's when I had a bunch, I found a bunch of records. Like what I look for is what pertains to that party. So at that time I was still, you know, I've always been, records have just always been a thing. That's a weekly visit to the record shop. And, you know, it's, it's more or less my church is where I go and dig. And so, but, but what I dig for depends on where I'm being placed, you know, where I'm placing myself with parties. So um, with, when I was doing more Jazzy Fox, I was trying to find jazz records in the vein of stuff that I was interested in. Once I was doing more Motown, again, this is all concurrent, too. So it's not like one yeah, or the other. Yeah, you're still doing it. Work, yeah. As I was doing uh, more Motown stuff, I was looking, I was seeking those songs out finding Motown acapella albums. So I've got a bunch of vinyl that's Motown acapellas. And so then what I was doing is digitizing that and going through collections of instrumentals and saying, what would work over this? Then a guy had like a Motown uh, karaoke album, which was 
just absolutely the Motown instrumentals with no vocal. I just extracted them. So then I was hit with all these instrumentals and now, okay, so I'm going to put like Black Eyed Peas over this Marvelettes track. Like what? And so, um, you know, that was when the Motown mash tape came out. Like, a lot of this is not chronologically ordered on the website, on my website. And the ID3 tags are kind of like hit or miss, some of them. But um, you can really tell where I was at that time based on a lot of like what the influences are. And, you know, at that time, I, I don't know if I was DJing quite as much at Booty and certainly not making as many mashups of that style, um, really pop, dance floor oriented. But then I started to come back and there was kind of like, I took a hiatus and I remember, you know, making one or two and one of them got uh, put on the booty top 10 again. And it was like Adriana had made some sort of remark in the comments, like, welcome back, DJ Fox. We've missed you or something. And I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, and it just felt not like I ever left. Um, but I hadn't really made any mashups of note in a while, I guess, um, on that level. And so then there was sort of this resurgence where I started really getting into booty again. And, um, you know, I've always been affiliated with the party, but uh, maybe wasn't contributing quite as much as I wanted to. And it, it just kind of is a, you know, direct reflection of my environment and what I'm doing at that time. And it, you know, um, so when I'm doing more Motown Monday stuff, then I focus on buying that vinyl or finding those edits that'll work for that party because I need, you know, need to focus on one thing. And then uh, Laszlo, which is a bar I've done 13 years, two Fridays a month, um, they really value vinyl too. You know, not every DJ that comes in there has to play vinyl. They just value it. And so that's a real home base for me. That's the longest residency I've had. And much love to Laszlo, who just opened up, um, you know, to-go cocktails for anybody curious. If you're in the San Francisco uh, Bay Area, I, I doubt they delivered it to Nashville, Tennessee, correct? They might not, but, you know, you may as well ask. Uh, anyway, so that's a real family for me, too. The chef and owner of Foreign Cinema Restaurant, which Laszlo is affiliated with, has a giant uh, closet full of vinyl right behind the DJ booth. So they are also vinyl collectors, um, you know, and more for that stuff. That is certainly a bar where people don't necessarily dance. Um, they're there to hang and hear good tunes. So... It's just different. So that's why, you know, I'll buy records for that. And then those will kind of cross over with the Motown vibe. But Motown Mondays is a full on dance party. Yeah. And it, it spans like 33 cities. Right. And also has a, a radio show that they've been doing since like 2018 on KPFA. Yep. Motown uh, Mom DJs Radio. Mom DJs is what they like to go by. And, and they have a Twitch channel, too. And that's just actually Motown on Mondays. I've really enjoyed the the mom DJs thing because again, you're you're a mom DJ and you're currently on Mom Masters of Mash. So it's oh that's true. All right, I didn't think about the, that. The mom that's connection. Right. Yep. So and that's been a very supportive group. Um, you know, thirty three cities, not all not all active at once, but um, Donovan uh, Don Gordo, we call him Gordo Cabeza, the founder of Motown Mondays, is just. Um, you know, an amazingly motivated person. Uh, really cool to be around him and just witness like how hard he works to make this happen. And, and what he does is kind of like how Booty did it is, um, you know, he's not going to be in every city at a, each time. He can't do that. That's not sustainable. But what we, he would do is go scope out a city, um, put the put the signal out there, the bat signal for like minded DJs that can, you know, hold down his night properly while maintaining the image that Motown Mondays represents, but also giving it its own flavor. So, you know, Mom LA, Motown Mondays LA, more, you know, if you go to that party, it's a little more hip hop style blends. Hip, you know, there's a constant hip hop influence at that party. Uh, Motown on Mondays Oakland very much values the originals. And then Motown Mondays SF is kind of anything goes. It could be either, you know, but each party has its own kind of flavor and that's what makes it so cool yeah and you know how monday's honolulu another uh, like stalwart of this of this party you know they just celebrated i think six years maybe more they they seem to have more of a reggae island vibe too but it's all unmistakably influenced by soul 
And so what we've been doing, you know, the, the 12 or the 11 year anniversary of mom uh, happened about a month ago and we had a 12 hour stream each hour, a different DJ from a mom of their, you know, respective city. And to hear the range of people coming in, it was just amazing. And, you know, really, really was special to hear just each person's take on this genre. And so it's not necessarily limited to Motown, as we like to say, it's Motown, close relatives, remixes, and sometimes some far off distant cousins too. Because, you know, Motown, that could include, in our opinion, Stax, Atlantic, it's not just uh, proprietary to the label, it's the sound of soul. Yeah. And then, you know, Motown, I mean, had a lot of, a lot of artists on that label that, you know, for example, Migos, did you know that they are signed to Motown? Not a lot of people do. Motown still signs a lot of artists, and a lot of them are current hip-hop, but you also have to remember Motown had Rick James on that label and a lot of 80s funk, you know, Daz Band. Oh, yeah. Um, they were all on Motown. That is still Motown. And so, you know, these sets can range yeah. all over the Boys place. Boys to men. That's right. That's right. So, you know, all these, all these things matter, and that's why we're able to take people on this really cool journey of what soul music is, was, and will be. And it's just, it's, you know, funk, soul based, and what really gets me in the end is grooves. Yeah. And that's what that music is all about, is it's so organic and just, you know, so distinct. Uh, so that's been a really cool influence, um, watching, watching, um, Gordo do his thing, and then you know being affiliated with it has, has clearly influenced um, my purchases on vinyl and just what it is I dig for. So I'm basically um, I go down wormholes depending on what I'm booked for. So when I found out I was booked for Booty um, Booty's Twitch stream, now I hadn't done a main stage set in so long because my role there has been to sort of provide that backroom vibe which I take a lot of pride in and I do it well. I don't see it as lesser than or any different than DJing a main room with the fist pumping set. I just see it as something different. Um, another way to excel at this party, you know? How can we make these people dance too without, letting, without having to make them listen to the same exact song as, or even vibe? So what we would do is um, counter program. So somebody would go out in the front room and be like, all right, they're playing more like electro house mashups. So let's do this back here. And it was, it's, you know, just a different way of still making a crowd move. Speaking of which, before we get into that, can you talk, tell me a little bit about how you first met cool Carlo? Yeah. Cool Carlo. What, you know, one of my best friends in the world, uh, we were actually double booked for a gig, which happens, happens in the club industry. And, you know, at that point it had happened before and I remember getting really mad about it and like, you know, actually the first gig I ever had, ever, I brought my records down there. I was like nervous and I went down there early to set up and make sure everything was good, which is a precursor to, you know, how I approach. I'm always very early. Um, I'm not the kind of DJ that shows up five minutes before and then, you know, wh wh where's my plug? <laughs> right. I'll get there actually at the same time as the opening DJ and listen to that whole set to make sure I'm not repeating those songs. Yeah. You know, I look at it like I want this to be good. And if I was a guest and the DJ played the same song as the last DJ, I'd kind of be like, come on, man, you know, got do your research or whatever. So I've just always been, you know, I like to get there early. So I got there and the club manager, you know, the stereotype of which I would see for years and still do. I'm like, hey, man, I'm here. And he goes, bad news, bro. And I was like, what's the bad news, bro? We double booked this night. So we already have another DJ coming in. So we don't need you. And I was just like, that sucks. You know, and I was crushed and I was pissed off. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm, I'm done. I'm not even trying. And the girlfriend at the time, who was an artist as well, a photographer, had a friend who was also a photographer working as a bartender at a different bar. And she's like, I'm going to make a few calls. We're, you're DJing tonight. And so I ended up DJing at this place. Thanks to her for really kicking me in the ass for that. And we got a bunch of people to come to this night. It was a Tuesday. And um, the bar, the bar owner was just like, that was great. We want you back. And I was like, that felt really good. Um, so anyway, later on, 
uh, when I had been doing bars and stuff for about five years, um, was double booked somewhere. And the guy who showed up was this guy, Carlo. And I was at that point just like, you know what? I had already had an experience that this worked out very well. I had another partner who I worked with for a few years after we got double booked and we were like, well, what do we do? You know, and I wasn't going to be like, well, this is my gig. You better get off the tables or and he didn't do that either. I said, why don't we just DJ together? You know, let's just both do this. Who cares? I'm here. Yeah. I've got a bunch of records. Like, I'm not going to storm out angrily. Let's just vibe out. Turns out Carlo was uh, very heavily into skateboarding, which I am too. Um, he just had this whole kind of DIY ethos thing to it. He's a huge vinyl enthusiast as well. We had a similar taste in music. He is an insane scratcher. Just an overall in incredible DJ, a very high level of quality. And we clicked immediately. So it was just like, not only are you a good DJ, but you know how to skate. You know, and if you're over 30, it gets harder and harder to find people that can skate, you know, and have the time to do it and are good and want to. And so we really bonded on that. So, you know, it was our extracurriculars where we would skate. We'd go all around those different skate parks and then go back and make music. He's uh, he's very good at mastering. So he's the one that mastered a lot of my Jazzy Fox stuff. He still masters my master mashups often you know when i just need a separate ear a separate set of ears to go over and just make it you know once because when, when you make mashups by the time you're done you've heard the song no less than a million times <laughs> right okay so it's good to have somebody else come in and be like here's here's what i would do you know and and i i welcome that criticism and constructive criticism it's just here's what i would do and Often I will send a mashup to the booty crew, you know, Doug, Adriana, you know, and anybody that has um, some some comments or thoughts, you know, especially mashup producers. I'll say, what do you think about this? Um, I'm open to advice. What would you do, if anything, differently? You know, and, and just tell me the truth. Because songs are, they're engineered a certain way. You know, there's the intro. There's... When it hits, you know, did you build it up enough to hit? Yeah. And all these little things of years and years of, of observing dance floors that you know it's going to work. You could even, the first time you play it out of the crowd, you could turn to your friend and be like, watch, watch <laughs> this. And you can predict it and it works. And then another, another big thing about Booty is coming in with that original song at the end, as we call the payoff, where... You know, people have endured this mashup. Let's say you mashed up Madonna and Dua Lipa or something, and you didn't put any Madonna in the song. It's just her instrumental. At the end, you better give them that Madonna, you know, last chorus, and let people do that sing-along. It's like it just feels so good. You know, surprisingly, there is a science to it. I mean, not surprisingly. People have been scientifically, you know, arranging songs for years and um, forever. Yeah. Structure and energy are really important to two songs for sure. And especially, you know, knowing how to, you know, leverage nostalgia and leverage, you know, the familiar, familiar with the unfamiliar is super, super important uh, to, you know, a song being like, just like you said, your guy that uh, you watch break down songs. What makes songs important? What was that guy's name? Uh, Rick Beato. Yeah, yeah Rick Be just like Rick Beato says, I mean, it's like there are these things that we know that that make songs you know s special now since we're talking about mashups uh, we started on something a while back uh earlier in this interview that we never really got to flesh out and i really want to go back there for a second uh or at least you know it, let's let's reposition ourselves back at that moment and work our way forward it's 2004 you're just starting or you you find out about booty mashup how did you find out about booty mashup yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We should have fleshed that out more. So no, we're doing um, it now. It's good. I, I, you know, I was part of a record, um, which for those that don't know, I mean, we have digital record pools now, but this was a record pool where every month you pay a certain amount, and it was affiliated with a radio station around here, 106 KML, the hip hop station. So every label would send the the newest hits, you know, the things that they wanted DJs to be playing at the club, and we'd go once a month or sometimes twice, and you go somewhere and get a big stack of records. That was the best night, you know? Best night of my week would be go home and just start listening to whatever it is that's, this is brand new, nobody has it. They're not even playing on the radio yet. 
And you know, there's certain songs that you get and you're just like, wow. I remember when we got Blow the Whistle by Too Short pool and I'm like, what the hell? Like that's huge. Fan, I'm like, this is gonna be a song I play forever. You could just tell. You're like, this is a hit. You can't deny it. And of course it was. And I remember getting like an E40 track and even like a Black Eyed Peas track where I was like, I know that I'm going to be playing this song for years to come. It's just, you, you can't fail. So I think one of them I got like, um, you know, there was a Damien Marley. Um, anyway, I just had a bunch, you know, the, the point of the 12 inch records was you have the, the radio version, the dirty version, the instrumental and the acapella. So it's giving you the puzzle pieces to mess around. And so that's what I was doing. And I just lined up, you know, first mashup I did was Tom's Diner by Suzanne Vega with Damien Marley, Road to Zion. And um, you just put them on acapella with the instrumental. And it was just like magic. You just hit it. And it's like, Whoa, what? What? And then I sort of just recorded those two and, and linked them up. And my friend heard it and was just like, man, this is cool. You know, you should check out this party booty. And he knew about it because he was affiliated with a party that was doing side trance at Booty at, at DNA Lounge at that time. And so he was aware of DNA Lounge's diverse roster of parties, one of which was Booty. Booty had just started, you know, so um, he just said, you should check this out. This is what you're doing. It's called mashups. And I was like, it is. All I felt was that I was just remixing songs in a creative way. Now, hip hop DJs have done that for years. Yeah, you know, it's all yeah. Um, so it was nothing new, but what he was saying, and he knew my diverse range. And I want to shout out my friend Peak here, who is another amazing DJ and musical influence. Um, DJs for a prominent camp at Burning Man, uh, Opulent Temple, and just into a wide range of stuff going from house to trance to even down tempo. What's his DJ Peak, handle? P, uh, DJ Peak. Um, He's not a huge promoter of his own stuff, but it's P E E K. Um, Brian Peak. I'm again. He could be somebody that goes by Brian Peak or DJ Peak. However, yeah. if he gets billed, he's stoked to be on the bill. Another humble, humble dude and, and um, very prolific DJ. And you know, was the was the reason I found out about Booty when I did and said you should check this out. So I went by myself and walked in and. Um, it was just, I felt immediately at home, not only because it was just a, a giant collective of freaky fun people, you know, you had every type of person under the, under the sun there, gay, straight, hipsters, hood dudes, like it didn't matter. And everybody knew they were there to hear something that they, so eventually you'd hear something you liked and that was cool. So I remember the first mashup I heard there was a mix of Foxy Lady. And that was what was playing when I walked in. And I was just like, I'm home. I'm home. It feels good. And I had in tow, you know, a mix CD I had made of, um, it was more of a DJ mix, but it did feature that Suzanne Vega track, as well as another track called Shakedown Monkey, which is Shakedown Street by the Grateful Dead, and Too Short, Shake That Monkey, which, as I was saying earlier, those are the direct clash of my main two influences. Bay Area hip hop and jam bands, you know? So that mix to me was like, this is conceptually funny because it's Shake That Monkey and Shakedown Street. Also, I'd say probably 100% of deadheads will hate this song and 100% of Too Short fans will hate this too. Now I've succeeded, right? How can you mix something together that is conceptually so amazing, yet both groups who affiliate themselves with these sources would hate it? <laughs> So that was kind of funny to me, you know, and I'm like, how can we make people, you know, and that just immediately spoke to me and Booty where it's like these extreme genre clashes and, and that still crosses my mind sometimes. It's like, all right, would original fans of both these songs hate it? Then I've succeeded. And so, you know, and that's one style of mashup is let's make something ridiculous. And, and I still thrive on that. And that's kind of where like that, Weird Al influence comes in. Like, how can just how can we be silly with music? So, and and I hate to say this, like during our blackout earlier in this episode, 
we lost that entire Weird Al conversation. Yeah, we were talking about Weird Al, man, and how you know I'd be in one room listening to Weird Al, and and again, I want to give Weird Al credit for being not only a, just a creative machine and a genius, but introducing a kid like myself. I mean, if you look at his albums, the songs he's parroting range from all over the place. You know, you've got like. He does Yoda, you know, Lola, the Kinks, which, of course, I mean, I think I knew that song as a kid, but I certainly didn't know I Lost on Jeopardy was a takeoff of Jeopardy. You know, uh, Greg Kinn and that kind of post-disco 80s vibe. I mean, and that's a fantastic song, but I didn't know about it. There were a lot of songs I just wasn't aware of that I discovered through Weird Al. And I mean... And just his whole approach to it is humor, first of all. But he's also creatively, like, he's, he's a genius, you know? Yeah. And, and so I, I like to take that humorous approach to mashups, but also, you know, I'll get serious, too. And that's where, in the last few years, I've started to uh, want to definitely be more of a crowd pleaser than a genre clasher, and, and both in equal amounts. But I just started realizing, like, you know, I want this to be unanimously like a good mix you know and so i think what really started that for me was in my opinion still like my most popular uh mashup was um the weekend and michael jackson so rock my face that's i can't feel my face and rock with you um that one just really hit the mark everybody that hears that is like wow you know or, or like uh, you know i've always been saying weekend sounds like michael jackson but now there's undeniable proof because you put him over an MJB. Well, to, to a couple of things real quick, a couple of observations and a couple of statements. Um, one, uh, that still sounds like novelty to me. It, it's taking something out of its time period that's mimicking an older time period and showing how that they're seamless. And uh, number two, uh, Weird Al uh, has been such a huge influence on mass up, mashups to begin with. Uh, simply because, like, I mean, everybody I've interviewed up to this point has all come out with, like, yeah, you know, Weird Al was a huge influence to me, which is, I, I'm, I'm, I take delight in because I'm also a huge Weird Al fan. But when you talk about Weird Al being a consummate musician, being someone who is super talented, I think that really speaks volumes to that you can be funny and, and, and also novel and at the same time take this seriously. You know, and it, and it it's it really has to do with the amount of love and care that you put into what it is that you're doing, um, how well you construct things, and the talent that it takes to be able to do it. Uh, a lot of people, when they when they want to dismiss novelty or when they want to turn around and talk about like how funny things are just kind of like easily disposable, they're they're saying it because it's like it's considered cheap or it's considered like ill constructed. But when you do something that is not only gives that immediate dopamine, you know, release because you're hearing something that's new for the first time or, or you're hearing something that is just so funny or so clever that you're just like, yes, uh, if it's done well, it can be this enduring long thing, just like Weird Al's career, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, and it's, it's like basically postmodern art is how I looked at it. And we were talking about this album I came out with. This is the one I handed out to Booty. And, you know, it was early on, and I didn't have Serato yet. This was an all-vinyl mix, and some of the mixes are slightly out of key, but it's so much I can barely even listen to it now. But listen, it worked. You know, it got me hired there. But the reason I like Postmodern Love is because, A, it's a takeoff of Modern Love, you know, like the Bowie song, but Postmodern because what we're doing is Postmodern Art. We are taking parts of other people's art and making something new out of it. And it's no, it's it's nothing to sneeze at. It's a great and it's a very acceptable genre of art. That's why it's named that. You know, it's it's a style. Yeah. Um, and it's a pastiche of other things, and that's essentially what DJing is. But it's especially what mashups are. Well, it, it also makes it so that mashups themselves, because they they pull from so many different uh, time periods, and because with the addition of new music every month and every year and everything as it keep, continues going, it always makes it fresh yet nostalgic at the same time. So mashups themselves are kind of timeless, I would say. Mm -hmm. And the style. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, and it's that quality of being able to take a, you know, for example, um, 
let's say there's a popular song out, you know, and I have to stay on top of these top 40 songs because of corporate events. You got to know what's hot. Yep. You never know what someone's going to ask for and you want to be prepared. Well, I might hate that song or whatever the popular song is, but I need to make a mashup out of it because that way I'm having fun with it. You know, if I've heard the song enough, I know the, the key and I know the, the structure. So I'll be like running it in my head. It often will get stuck in my head. And I'm like, ah, so how can I make this better on myself? And the answer is to make a mashup out of it. Uh, that way, you know, I'm still technically playing a top 40 song, but it's going to be on my terms. Right. And being staying on top of that top 40 thing, you have to know the difference between da baby, little baby and little boozy. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that can be tough. And I still don't, I, I don't know if I could tell you the difference between Little Baby and Dub Baby, who were coincidentally on a track. <laughs> I was like, I can't tell the difference. Then my friend sends me one that's like Dub Baby featuring Little Baby. And I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> Are you trying to confuse us now? This is ridiculous. Or, you know, uh, so I just think that's funny. But, uh, you know, and I enjoy staying on top of it. I'm a music lover no matter what it is. So um, I can appreciate what makes a song popular, even if I don't necessarily identify with it. Um, I know what works and I know why people are dancing to it. Or, you know, when you hear a song, you're like, it's the beat they like. Or are they singing along? So this is how I'll experiment. Are they singing along with the beat or are they dancing to it? Yeah. And, and so, or are they singing along with the lyrics? Which part of this song is what works? And so that's what determines what element am I going to mash up? Is it a sing along or is it a dance? So if it's a dance song where they just know the beat, then that's to me what is the most valuable element to blend with something else. Or if it's the opposite, you know, how can I take this vocal and reframe it? So people are still singing along, but they didn't realize it's over like an 80s beat. Um, so that's that's a major thing, too, is testing out these songs and watching people dance to it or sing to it or both, you know, and then then you're lucky because then you can mash up either. Yeah. Now, I, I I normally don't do this, but somebody did say something just recently in the comments here that I, I find uh, very important uh, to discuss. Uh, and it goes back a little bit into our conversation about you, you going to school. What did you graduate? Uh, what was your your degree in? Uh, degree was communications with a music minor. With a music so, minor. And so you've yeah. taken music theory and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I took music theory and, um, you know, very cool class. Um, I'd taken a bunch of classes like that. Um, you know, even in high school, we had one called Early American Jazz, which was uh, a great class. And, and one, of the, one of the tests was, you know, this guy would play all these songs from the swing era all the way up to the 60s. This teacher, he was the band leader at school. I wasn't in the band at school, but this guy was extremely enthusiastic about this. And uh, I really liked him. He didn't like me because I was a terror to teach. I was a class clown, actually voted that at the senior year. Um, and I was, you know, I really, I was in there for the laugh. And uh, this poor guy had to deal with me for a whole semester, but God bless him. He, he respected me. And uh, one of the tests would be, after the whole semester, we would he would play a snippet of a song on a cassette, and our goal was to we'd have to write down what that song was. So recall, you know, and that's one of these things. I never forget a song or artist. Ever since I was a kid, I'll be like, "What song is this?" Somebody tells me, it's instantly in there. Now I can't really tell you what I had for dinner yesterday, but I can list like the top hundred from you know 1957. Uh, I don't know what it is. It's just a musical recall. Like it's photographic memory of songs and the titles. And it's just, I don't know what it is. It's a very strange skill. Um, so I aced that class because I was recall. I had the ability to recall these songs. He'd be like, you know, what is this one? He'd just play it. And then I'd be like, oh, that's easy. Tommy Dorsey. Or, you know, artists that are like a century before I was born. And uh, so that was a big influence. Um, and uh, yeah, so music theory and communications was more of like, um, you had these three aspects. One was like mass media, one was sort of family communication, and then one was like speech, you know, uh, interpersonal communication. So kind of like 
speech writing and what, what makes a speech good and eulogies. I focused on that and kind of the mass media learning, you know, about those aspects. And then the music minor sort of rounded that out. But really, it was that role, you know, of throwing the parties at the fraternity. School was, school was extracurricular. Real experience in college was from personal interactions, you know, the real life applications of this major, you know, without realizing it. And, you know, just, just people, you know, I like being around people. That's, that's my thing. And that's, if anything, what I learned from college <laughs> was that I, I thrive off the interaction and, um, and just watching people and, and solving problems real time. It's, it's a personality trait I learned is much like, um, you know, a paramedic almost, or, a, you know, somebody that works in an emergency room. You like dealing, you like solving problems real time. And yeah. um, that, that's a thing about DJing is like, there is no here, it's, there's no then or future. It's what are you doing right now? There's not a problem that you can't fix. Mm -hmm. So I've learned that's, I thrive off that more than anything, solving a problem. No, of course. Yeah. I know what you're doing with that. Last <laughs> night, it took, my life. Uh, it took me a minute, but yeah. Um, yeah. Those were my majors. Um, and I took wide range. Luckily the communications major at my school was sort of like a last resort for people that weren't going to graduate on time. So if you failed out of business school, you could still accomplish the entire major in just under three semesters. So what that allowed you to do is take a wide range of classes, you know, the real liberal arts education. Yeah. And I really enjoyed that. Well, there, you know, there's learned. something to be said about like getting an education, not necessarily aimed towards a job, but like we as humans bettering ourselves and making ourselves smarter and learning a broader range of subjects to make you a, a more competent human, you know? Mm hmm. Uh, let's get back into this early booty thing because, uh, again, I'm really, I'm really fixated on your. Uh, it, it's really so interesting to me how, and this is what makes you different from a lot of the people that I've interviewed and a lot of the people that uh, are within our scene, is that, or I should say, the prominent people in our scene, is that you, you didn't come up in Gaibo, you didn't come up in any of the, the, you know, the, the. UK bootleg scene or whatnot. You had the early exposure to Z DJ Z Trip, which you thought was novel, but it didn't really push you. Uh, it wasn't until you started, you know, like you said, you got the the vinyl subscription service, the DJ subscription service, started playing around with records on your own. Uh, you actually made and pressed up a CD. I did that several times. Uh, the first few albums I made, uh, first couple at least. I had like in our local Amoeba store and I, and I paid, you know, just like a duplication service and it ended up being like, you know, $3 a disc and I sold them for five or something. But that, but the specifically the very first one you did was called what? Oh, that was Postmodern Love Volume 2. Um, why why then, Volume 2 if it was your first one? I, actually, I had made one. Um, it just didn't exist on CD. Oh, okay. So it was just kind of a concept. Uh and so this was the next project. It was Postmodern Love Volume 2. Postmodern Love 1 is even worse. So, well, I mean, you know, they're not bad. It was just the early stages. It was just me toying with it. And, uh, and this is 2005, it. right? Yeah, 2005 is when I did Postmodern Love 2. It took me a couple years to start, you know, start the ball rolling on the DJing. And again, I didn't even, I didn't even really have a computer until 2005. Um, so I wasn't really exposed to um, a lot of those mashup forums. You know, yeah. I wasn't aware of it. But and then, like I said, you, so you had this CD, your friend turns around and tells you about Booty, you go to Booty, you're, you walk in, you feel like you're at home because, you know, here's a song with your name playing in it. The people there seem to be friendly enough. At that point, was it just you or was it you and, uh, you and Carlo that started doing I, that. At that point. I didn't meet Carlo for another few years. So this was just me. I just, you know, I've always been kind of a, an isolationist when it comes to my music, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm even wary to partner up with anybody sometimes, even on DJing, just because like, um, well, especially with mashups, it's just, I, I get these very specific ideas and I'm kind of nutty and I, and I don't want anybody to really have to get in my head. 
it might be very frustrating for them or confusing. <laughs> so at this point, you're playing you, when you're when you're playing booty these these early gigs. First of all, how did you approach them? Not just as a an attendee of booty. How did you approach them as far as like getting invited to play a main floor gig? Um, you know, I gave the CD to them and um, just emailed periodically, I believe, and I, I just kept showing up and saying hi. Um, the goal was really, I get a DJ, but it was more just to be involved in a scene that I could identify with. And, um, and that was really special to me. And, and hearing these songs that are like mind blowers, you know, the first time somebody hears mashups that are really good. And that's another thing I want to mention about booty is the bar is set so high. Like yeah. you get mashups to booty. If it's not in key, you're gone. Like, I'm sorry. Um, you know, there's a high level and, and the same level that I would like to think that I, I bring, you know, so I really identified with that. And, and then the mashups they were putting out on the top 10, I was like, each one of these is very well thought out, conceptually amazing. Um, it's really cool. So I just latched onto that and I was showing up more and I just kept making more stuff. Once I realized what I was doing was a thing, I was like, so the first couple years is a real burst of ideas. And uh, also, especially once I started to get more digital files and was able to mix things a little easier. Um, and then I just kept submitting songs. And then I think one of them just hit the mark. One of them got their attention and they're like, oh yeah. And that was when I got the invite. And you know, still it was so, so long ago, um, but I remember it so clearly. I think it was 2006 is when I got my first booking, maybe 2007. Um, but I remember it very well. And just, it was so such an, um, a thrilling event for me to be on that, in that main room and having people dance into my stuff. It was like, this is, this is satisfying. And I had already had that feeling DJing for groups of people before, but this was a new thing because it felt like something I had done myself. Yeah. So that first gig, do you remember who was also playing on that bill? Like even just amongst Booty Crew, was it like J DJ JR? Was it A and D? I don't was it know. I need to look that up because I know I have the flyer somewhere from my first night. But I think I was so nervous, I couldn't. I wasn't even like. I was just all nerves. But probably Party Ben, you know, or somebody like it was the earlier days. Uh, probably Adriana or. Uh, Mysterious D or any one of the originals, there wasn't a huge uh, roster at that point. You know, it was the main staples of the creators of that party at that point. Yeah, and they did it best, to be honest. You know, these were these were people collecting songs from these online forums, and they had been for a minute. So they had a wide range of styles. Whereas, like you know, I had seven mashups I had made, and that's pretty much all I knew. It was just like, I don't know, I'm just, here's what I've made. So my set, my first set was probably 15 original mashups in a row. And, you know, I've learned now it's, you know, of course, best to round out your set with other people's, you know, and sort of bring all these different styles in and create a vibe that's not just your own. But at that point, my goal was make enough mashups to fill an hour. You know, they have to be mine. This is a showcase set of my stuff. I'm the performer. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I remember that gig well. You know, it was very, very cool. So as you're making your way, like, into, uh, you know, the, the booty organization and becoming, like, a more of a, a regular mainstay, um, are there – when when did – it wasn't – when did – what year would you say that you got together with Cool Carlo and brought uh, Damn Gina, which was the night that you two did together – at a previous place, um, which, what was the name of that place? I can't remember. Exactly. So Dam Gina, it's called Ambassador. So Dam Gina was a concept party uh, created by Carlo and our buddy Clayton. Uh, Clayton ended up moving and... I'm just pointing well, at the Dam Gina logo. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, huh? uh, um, Carlo and I, we met and then it was a couple years till we started really DJing together. Um, but damn Gina was a party that started at like 6 p.m. and it went till 10 p.m. It was just a happy hour and they had two dollar snacks and drinks and it just blew up. It just got busy. And then he had me come in and we partnered up and we're doing this party. 
Um, at that point, I was heavily affiliated with Booty. Now I was um, in there, you know, and doing not as many main stage sets, but um, back room. You know, they at this point opened up more rooms. Booty was growing. And so they needed people to do those back rooms and do them well. And so I was very happy doing that um, because, as I was saying, we'd counter program. So we'd start we do more hip hop style mashups, which is something I've always been into making. Um, whereas the front one would be like these fist pumpers. So that's what I was doing. But then that room was going to be open way later. You know, you'd be, end up being five, six hours standing there. You'd have to like look and see when the bathroom was free and like run in there to get get it in there before you could have had to change the song out so we were asked and this was a general trend for that back room we want like a we want a duo back there at least you know we want to have one or two people uh acting as a collective in that room it just makes it just broadens the appeal and it makes your life a little easier so the natural choice for that was carlo because he had involved me in Damn Gina, we seemed to collaborate very well. Um, we had a great, you know, the, the true way you can trust a DJ is that you don't have to, you don't even worry that you're gonna play the same songs. I could leave the room for an hour and come back and know for a fact we would have had two completely different sets. Yeah. So we were both bringing a different, uh, but equally enthusiastic, energetic take to this party. And so Damn Gina Tuesday lasted, uh, I mean, I think we did five years at Ambassador until they ended up closing. We were also doing Damn Gina East, which was in the East Bay at another place called Shattuck Downlow. Sadly, rest in peace to that venue. That was a cool spot. A lot of cool live music and a dark and dirty basement that was huge. Great sound system. So we had, at one point, Damn Gina and Damn Gina East going on. So two nights a week that were cracking. And then literally the same month or two, those two places closed independently of each other, but all of a sudden we had no damn Gina. And just before that happened, we had been invited to do a damn Gina room at uh, DNA Lounge. So that lasted a few years and we were doing uh, great work there. And um, we really were focusing on the hip hop style mashups. And then we learned, you know, it doesn't always have to be all mashups back there. Then that really opened our doors because we could play some originals and then mix a mashup in. And if that doesn't fly, you could go back to the original. So we had a little more leeway to, to not just play mashups, which was helpful to us because not everybody wants to hear them all the time. They will if they're in the front room at DNA Lounge, but maybe sometimes the person who's with that group who loves mashups, wants to hear something slightly different. So we give them that opportunity. Yeah. And for those of you who aren't uh, or who are watching, who aren't familiar with DNA Lounge, it is a sprawling complex of a nightclub. It's got uh, the, uh, what's it called? The above room. And then there's the lounge off to the side. And then there's another room that's the, the it's, it's like Dazzle. There was uh, Dazzle room. Yeah. For a time, they had four rooms open at all times. Um, then it's kind of shrunk. It just depends on the night, but most of the time, you know, in the before times, at least before quarantine, we were running two rooms consistently. And then the main room is actually uh, uh, two floors with a, a terrace as the second floor. Uh, right, it wraps there on the around second thing. Kind of a U-shaped terrace. Yeah, um, it's, it's huge. On each side. It's, it is enormous. What um, would you say the the occupancy uh, capacity of that club is? I mean, I'd say the main room, if you really packed it in there, 800,000 people. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's generous. But you could cram them in there. Yeah. So I'd be interested to actually know that number. I'm not sure. I'm just responding quickly to a uh, comment here. Someone was asking if I have a Twitch channel I can follow. And I just want to emphasize that, yes, uh, my channel is at Fox Sounds, one word, where I play not only mashups, but just a wide, eclectic range of you know, a combination of my vinyl, sometimes my Jazzy Fox stuff. Uh, Thursdays, for example, I play all classic hip hop R and B vinyl. That's pretty much every Thursday. Fridays, you know, it just depends. You're just gonna have to follow and find out for yourself. But yeah, follow and subscribe. Example, Once again, that's Twitch.tv/foxsounds. 
I also seen make sure that you go to foxsounds.net and download all of these mashups that we're talking about. Again, I want to get, while we have, because uh, we only have a little bit more time, we've gone over our time because okay. of all the problems that we had previously. Oh, I wanted to give true. you your full two hours here, but we do need probably need to wrap it up here shortly. I, I, want, I wanted to get into uh, your busiest time uh, of making mashups was that entry period. Uh, you see, we see this a lot within most mashup artists. I mean, even Lobster Dust, when we were talking about pre- him previously, like the first couple of years, he just pounded them out ferociously in the same way you did the same thing. Uh, oddly enough, your your first album, quote-unquote, compilation or album of mashups that you put out, what was the title of that <laughs> that yeah, compilation? That was mashups Volume 7, which, again, like I don't know what I was thinking. I think the combination of trying to generate interest and, and it did work. Hey, can I get mashups volume one through six? You know, cause then it was like, Oh uh, yeah, I guess people like them, but it was difficult to, uh, I just, you know, again, I'm just kind of like irreverent and I thought it was funny to me in my own mind to just come out with the most random number first. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I don't know why I did that, but, and then I came out. So the reason I stopped making, CDs was because it was too much to maintain. So I had mashups volume seven, then I made mashups volume eight all on CD and it was just getting too expensive to maintain where all I really wanted to do was just keep creating. And so that's why the benefit of the website came out. It's just one place where they all are and uh, they're free, you know, but as you, you can see, if you go to the, the link on the website, that's a drop down menu for mashups, you can see it goes seven, eight, nine, and then it just starts going into random names. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times these weren't these projects weren't created with a project in mind. It was just um, a group of mashups I had made over the last several months. Boom, put them together in a certain order and title it something. Um, and in the last two or three years, which has been my most productive mashup since I started making them, I went through this kind of lull, which is a combination of wanting to do other projects and being really busy as a vinyl DJ, you know, and, and that is a whole energy source is putting the effort into organizing records constant, you know, getting ready for these private events where a couple sends me like a hundred songs and I have to go through that. You know, this all takes up a lot of time and I give my hundred percent energy to it. And then as I was saying earlier, I need to balance that out with like health and other things. I can't just do music all day. Yeah. And so one day of that week might be dedicated to working out that playlist for that couple that's a day that I normally would have spent making mashups. Yeah. So um, I've, I've been really happy with the re- the last two years of making mashups. Um, you know, as, as, it, as was said by Adrian, I'm back, you know, and I've been really making like a very productive last streak that I'm, ex- I'm very proud of, you know, and um, having stuff featured on um, compilations and the ultimate compliment to me, having other DJs play my track. And so, for example, the other night we were watching the Motown Mondays stream and a DJ I've met once, maybe in passing from L.A., played my song, did not know I was watching, didn't know. And that to me was like chills down my spine, a real dopamine burst, just like that's it, like make a mashup or a blend or whatever, you know, that other people want to play. That's the goal now is like. Sure, I can make these funny ones that are conceptually ridiculous, but I want ones that someone can work into a set, you know, that doesn't necessarily focus on blends or mashups, that fits in there naturally. And so that's been just uh, more DJing at Motown on Mondays and corporate events has really made me into more of a crowd pleaser. And yeah. so that, that's a main, you know, and still, still remain true to my style and which I think at this point can be defined as smooth. That's three O's and a V. Okay. You're the yacht rock of mashups. Basically. And that's, that's what was mentioned to me is uh, my, my reputation among the booty crew is uh, I'm Mr. Smooth, you know, and <laughs> there are a lot of other great DJs that can just annihilate that fist pumping segment of the night. And God bless it. You know, that is an amazing. And I'm just not quite, I could do that. But just I'm more drawn to the funk and soul, and that's just yeah. me. You I know? see that as a plus. I see that as a giant win. Number one, because like we discussed earlier, like as as a DJ who you know plays other people's mashups, it's like 
it's good to have people who can fill in the 96 BPM to one, uh, you know, 116 uh, BPM range, as well as something that you don't hit, get a lot because there is that prejudice thing. It's hip hop and R and B is you're using all of these hip hop or R and B instrumentals. You know, you're using, you're using things that, you know, rock a party and that I know rock a party, but don't often get thrown into a, a, a mashup, you know, club atmosphere. Uh, and so your, your stuff uh, fills a giant hole. It's a need really uh, within the community. And, and not to say that there aren't other um, DJ, D, uh, mashup producers that do this. Cause there are plenty uh, that uh, also, I, I feel like need more recognition. Um, and I, also, to tie this together with our conversation that we've had here today, your mashups are tied together. Like, first of all, let, let's go into you, you know, are really an extrovert when it comes to sports. You know, you while you joined a fraternity out of necessity, you really did enjoy that interactivity with a crew and a group. You didn't have any bands growing up. You know, you were your music maker, but you did a lot of that in solitude, right? So this is your Very personal isolated. thing. Yeah. And I mean, I, that tape thing I was saying about double tracking myself, I was embarrassed to let people even know that I could sing, <laughs> you know, and it's just, it's weird. It was like this kind of thing I kept to myself. And yeah, it was and that way in college, it was almost like not that anyone is going to judge me, but I just felt like they might. Yeah, and I don't know what it was. I just had these other extrovert qualities where I was kind of a a leader, and people would look up to me, and I'm a good friend and all that. But then when it came to music, it was just like this thing I did that uh, people knew about, but it was just it was a release for me, and it was the exact opposite. I, you know, and I did try to work with some bands for a while, but I just preferred kind of working alone it was like a cathartic thing for me i, f- I find it interesting to look at to your musical trajectory as a dj and and mashup artist too because it's like again you heard that z trip thing you weren't connected to any kind of a peer group there was no uk scene for you you weren't on like you know mash sticks or gaibo or any of these other things and you did find a peer group but it was locally through booty so you already like your peer group started at the top of the U.S. mashup scene, and you got in, and like you were saying, like the the pressure was uh, really high on you to produce high end mashups because it's like they're used to receiving the best. They require you to have things in key and everything else like that. So you still got the tutelage that you would get from you know the tweaks room on Gaibo or anything else like that, but specifically within this context. So you stayed in this context, and when you look at your other stuff you did mashup mashup on mondays the smoked out soul stuff when you talk about uh, all of your side projects jazzy jazzy fox and stuff like that and then even your own bar gig there with uh with a was it a lazlo the at lazlo but it, it's called foxy fridays or foxy original fridays. foxy fridays it's oh, a whole yeah. other story um <laughs> that you you see some of the best things that i know about artists that i respect and artists that i I appreciate the most is that their music is a, an amalgam of everything that they do. Like you, you've taken such a personal tone with your music and you've pulled from, you know, your Motown side and from your jazzy side and from the mashup side. And it it all resides in this one thing. And so it's like you are putting, it shows that you put all of yourself into your work and you have such a huge catalog. Like I said, you're you're close. You're like 160 mashups somewhere like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, and it, and and growing because you're still making them. I'm still making them. It's just it just keeps adding up, and I'm I'm so excited about that. And it's taken time. I mean, it just sometimes it feels like the creativity slows to a crawl. Other times, I just can't I can't make them fast enough. And um, I'm kind of going through one of those bursts right now especially because of you know my my involvement back in the booty twitch channel and you know i basically was being asked to do a main stage set which is something i hadn't done in a while and that's no problem it's just was like a mindset i'm like all right well you know time to start making some more stuff and uh 
And then when I think I was I was commended, uh, I did a certain I did an earlier set for Booty, and I played a lot of my smoother stuff. And um, a lot of our a lot of our fans at that point and followers had been expecting nothing but club bangers the whole time. And when I came at them with this smoother element, they were like, "Uh, like it just sort of was a a whole vibe that was unexpected." So that was very confirm. That was a confirmation for me that like I am doing this right. I'm gonna, I gotta keep doing this. So I've been really inspired lately just by like the kind words and, you know, thank you for all the kind words. They're the heartfelt, I mean it. Is, it's really, it's, you know, any artist can relate. You go through periods of doubt and value, you know, and, and what is my worth? Um, if you have writer's block, you know, you can feel useless. And, you know, anything I've done up to this point isn't even worth mentioning because that was two years ago. But that's not true, you know. It's just an evolution. It's constantly evolving, and you know, it's good to have a support group. And you know, shout out to Mrs. Fox, my wife, for uh, really, really supporting me through this whole thing, and and understanding that it is um, it's such a journey, you know, and, and a journey of doubt, and um, and then highs and lows, highs and lows. It's like you got to have highs to have lows, and sometimes that that low can be real and. But that, that's the journey of an artist. That's that you're describing exactly what artists go through every day. Yep. Yep. You know? Every day. So which is why supporting artists is important, ladies and gentlemen. Make sure you important. do this. Uh yeah. And the, the Twitch channel has really given me some con some confidence to really put it out there and especially because it's not you're you're not dealing with a packed dance floor. But you know, I still treat it that way, but it also means you can play songs that you might not normally play and you might just surprise yourself with stuff that works. So I think my biggest one was I got booked to play the booty party on Twitch on World Goth Day. And like, I am not really <laughs> goth, you know, but it was like I had this slot now and it's like, hey, so Fox, um, what you got for goth stuff? And I'm like, uh, I don't really know. And I ended up busting out this mashup. It was one of the first ones I made. And um, it was White Zombie with Cypress Hill. And I mean that I guess technically counted as goth, but I got all of these it works. comments in the in the in the comments, and I was like, I guess this is a hit, you know. And so I'll definitely be playing that one again, although I want to remake it. And so that's been a whole thing too, is some of these older mashups. They're just not. It's hard for me to still play them now because I feel like the production quality that I could apply to this now is so much better that um, I've been committed to remaking a bunch of mashups during quarantine. So stay tuned for those. You see a lot of mashup artists do that. And even party bin did that over, over the years where he would, he would like post his early stuff and then be like, uh, here's my 2006 remaster, you know, here's my, yeah, know. I think it's fair. And I think just based on the nature of it, it's totally worth it. You know, if, if even it gives that mashup a new life or a bunch of people are exposed to it that weren't before. It's pretty cool. And it feels good, you know, to to watch, say, like, okay, I made this mashup 10 years ago and it took me six hours. And then I did it today and it took me one hour. And it's like, that's progress. <laughs> and learning how to make these things, how to manipulate these songs faster to arrive at your result, whether, whether that's good or bad. So, I mean, I'll admit, most of the time, it's going to be a trial and error. And a lot of the ideas are going to fall flat. And I'm, I'm not afraid of just tossing them. I don't get married to ideas. If I've been working on something for an hour and it's still struggling to hit me where it matters, throw it away. Start over. I wanted to point something out, not just to you, but to the audience, too. I've been thinking a lot about the last 20 years of mashups, especially doing this show. And I realized that, you know, there are mashup artists that, you know, started at the beginning and still to this day do stuff. But there's a lot of mashup artists that only have a a period with, with which they create and then they move on um, because of that and or because of, you know, certain artists have like a really dedicated period where they, they put out the most stuff and then they just kind of like do a little bit of stuff. Um, it looks like when I, when I look at those artists and in, in those time periods, and I'm sorry to take so long to get to this point, but uh, it looks as if, this entire 20 years of, of mashups and maybe it's, maybe it's like this in all genres of music, but it's almost like high school, 
like snippets of years that create what I like to call waves. So it's like, you know, the 1999 to 2002 uh, era of mashups where like your freelance Hellraisers and stuff like that. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, I just blanked on uh, somebody else to use from that time period. Um, uh, I, it's right at the forefront of my tongue, but I can't do it. But anyway, but then 2002 to 2005, there's a whole other wave of mashup artists. And that's where you get in, like, you know, say your party bins and, like, even myself. And then there's people like yourself and Lobster Dust, like, are that third wave of mashup artists. Like, 2006-ish to 2012 is generally, like, where the, the bulk of their, you know, material lays and where they, like, really made their mark. Uh, then there's, like, the, the fourth. And there's, there's five waves currently that I have marked out. And this is just a, a work in process. This is a thought as far as, like being able to really hone in on how our scene works and the people who come through this, but uh, you being third wave uh, in the mashup scene, uh, can you identify other people that might be, and since you're specifically located there in San Francisco, that might be also part of that same wave people that you came up with along alongside of? I mean, the people that I admire, uh, their production the most are, uh, you know, DJ Trip. Yeah. A local booty. Oh, yeah. But yeah, he's definitely like second wave he's, for sure. He, you know, he's got that brain that's just, you know, it's he's genius level. Same with Lobster Dust. I mean, his output has been extremely prolific. And, you know, Schmoly is a huge. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, I mean, and, and a lot of the metal, you know, metal, huge influence. I know on a lot of mashup DJs, but. You know, the, his metal mashups are mind blowing, you know, and I love the people that can think of concepts that just shouldn't work, but they do. And they work so well that you can even dance to it. So, you know, um, I, I, everybody evolves. But like at first, those are those are my main people that every time I, I see one of their mashups on the top 10, I know it's going to be amazing. Speaking of which, have you, uh, since you are so about the groove when it comes to music and you are so soulful with yourself and you, you're a self-proclaimed, you know, metalhead or rock fan, um, I'm assuming that you've been paying attention to the, to the uh, soul metal movement of Bill McClintock. I love it. And Bill McClintock is, is like, I guess you'd call him fifth wave. I don't really know. Yeah. But he brought back this missing element to me which is like the true novelty but just perfectly executed so i'm very inspired by him to be honest yeah he's um, he's uh, specifically stated in previous interviews and i and i hope to have him as a guest on the show here soon so we can elaborate on this but he he specifically said that he was inspired by dj cummerbund that uh -huh. he sure. listened to a cummerbund thing thought his mind exploded and was like that's it i gotta do this yeah yeah, so I mean, and I love those those kinds of things too. I guess what ended up happening is um, the last few years, which I would I would I would just um, call my second wave of mashups because I did go through this lull. That was for many reasons, one of which was I was focused on the Jazzy Fox project, which was just kind of a consuming thing for me. And the yeah. second one, I just wasn't inspired by pop music for those few years. Whereas 2012. Pre and, and prior, you had like Katy Perry and Rihanna and all these pop divas that I just couldn't stop mixing together because it was just, they were just fun, you know? And then there was kind of this lull where I just wasn't totally feeling it. And then you came back with like the weekend and Dua Lipa these last couple of years. And it's just all of a sudden, I feel like I have more source material. I've become more inspired to make what my point was about this, you know, playing at Smoked Out Soul, Motown Mondays. That's not necessarily the venue for a Bill McClintock mashup. Right. Okay. So it's like, I, that's when that MJ weekend mashup works perfectly because I have an element of Motown Mondays in there. You could totally play rock with you at Motown Mondays and get away with it. You probably wouldn't play. I can't feel my face with you because it's too new, but put the vocals over that instrumental. It fits right in. And so, you know, it's it's always what I'm exposed to. So that I actually have a current one that's Dua Lipa also versus Michael Jackson off the wall, which I think is just pure heat. And I came up with that one while attending Motown Monday and hearing someone else play that. Plus, I have a buddy who listens to Dua Lipa. So I had all this like stuff going on in my head and it was just like 
ding, 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 ding. And I went home and made it that night. So I think there's like this isolationist thing. The isolationist um, aspect of making the music is cool. But I get my inspirations from being out in public around people and hearing when people do stuff. It's just a constant, you know, listening to the radio. It's just never ending, you know. And then, of course, the crazy jukebox that's called My Brain that just, you know, if I go on a bike ride, we're talking like an hour. I might have, you know, no fewer than 35 songs rush through that, rush through my head in no particular order. That could range from, you know, Chantilly Lace to Way Down Yonder on the Chattahoochee by Alan Jackson and then back to The weekend or something. It's just... Um, a stream of consciousness type thing. And, um, you know, I, I look at it as a, as a trait, not necessarily a drawback. It's like this constant random kitchen sink style of musical influences. And that's what I'm, that's what I bring to it, but I'm able to focus on a certain vibe. So for example, maybe later today, I might be streaming. Uh, that's going to be all soul and funk. And, you know, I put together a crate the other night for Motown Mondays that I wound up not using because my friends, one of his turntables was broken. So I have a set ready to go. That was all just kind of like pulling from the crates and being like, all right, I got a little 80s funk in here. I got a little of this. And that's what I love about not planning a set is I'll just put everything in a crate, throw it in front of me. Let's just do this. Let's navigate this live. Yeah. That that is the fun part for me is live doing it live like not yeah. planning a whole lot and uh that's that's what gives me a thrill is um i used to plan every set i remember planning every set i had things written down in order that is boring to me now you know yeah. now i want to just see where it goes and uh, i think people like that too because people there's nothing wrong with a little bit of a mistake here and there it makes yeah. it human yeah, you're and, interacting, uh, you're having a conversation with your audience. And that's really what a lot of DJs, good DJs are doing. Like when when you talk about bedroom DJs or when we talk about like people who again, they're all in their head, they're like, "Man, I'm going to play this song and it's going to be the best thing ever." It's like they're not they're they're forcing their opinion on their dance floor. You know, they're they're you've been there. We've both put on a song that we thought would completely work. We see, you know, it have terrible response and we immediately mix out of it and into something else to like pull that back out and then you yeah. find those things you find what works you find what doesn't it's it's again getting to know your audience letting your audience get to know you and once you have that that trust then you're able to play some of the more crazier things because then they'll be like oh well he obviously must like this so now i like this and they, they've got that kind of friendship on the dance floor you know uh -huh. Mm -hmm. which is totally it you were talking about you know funk and soul and whatnot uh let's let's try to wrap this up here just just here in just a bit but i want to talk about a most more recent project a compilation a, a mashup album you put out with smoked out soul uh called summer snaps which came mm -hmm. out last summer uh in 2019 um first of all tell me a little bit about smoked out soul and how you get, became a uh, part of that movement and then tell me about about, about that album uh, so those guys are a collective. Smoked Out Soul was started by my friend Zeb, who's also another DJ, DJ Zebuel, Z-E-B-U-E-L. Um, he is an awesome musician. He, he plays guitar while he DJs, basically. Um, and Smoked Out Soul is a collective. It's basically a band, but the base of the band is a DJ. Um, okay. So we've got a drummer, trumpet, uh, various horns and percussion. It was a constant rotating cast of people. And, um, you know, for a time they were doing an upstairs room as well. And this is at Monarch. Um, and the upstairs room, they wanted basically two floors of funk, you know, smoked out souls, funk, funk bass, like hundred percent. Um, no matter what era or style, a lot of it was newer remixes of funk, a lot of which Zebul has made himself. Um, and they're just really heavy. Um, he comes from a kind of a dubstep background and more dubby. So his stuff is very dirty and grimy, and I love that. But he's bridging that with, you know, old school funk. So his remixes have a lot of low end. They're very grimy. And then you got a band playing over it. So he had me come in, and it was super fun for me because it really did feel like you're collaborating. You know, you're nodding to the drummer when it's about to change. Or I'll be like, 
in order to make this mix after this song, because you're always planning a couple mixes ahead, is I'm going to speed this up a tiny bit. So I'd look at him and be like, you know, and he'd be like, oh, all right. Like, so we're communicating through that. And, and that was very satisfying. Um, and then when Smoked Out Soul, they were putting out a couple projects and, you know, taking other DJs that had played with them. And um, so they, it was all mostly DJs that contributed to that project were guest DJs from that night. And my main affiliation with them for a time, for about four or five months, was to, I played all vinyl funk upstairs at the club, not downstairs. Downstairs was the main event, once again, like Booty. But they needed someone to fill that space upstairs that could do it well. And, you know, I, I didn't never, never expected anyone to dance up there. That's okay. What that room needed was just a solid, you know, some funk songs, like somebody up there handling it correctly. Um, and then they ended up kind of like not having that anymore. That was club management wanted to switch things up and have two completely separate rooms. But I still maintained that collaboration with them. Um, and so when they put out that Smoky Blends album, I had already made a mashup um, a while back, but it was just one that spoke for this party, really represented the vibe they were going for, which was kind of, you know, Marvin Gaye over um, DNCE. You know, there's another one of those songs, Cake by the Ocean. I know it's a popular song. I know it gets everybody going, but I kind of hate it. But what I do love is the production of that beat. I mean, that beat is funk. Yeah. You know, it's polished pop funk, and you can kind of clown on it for being very overproduced. But I'll tell you what, that's what makes people dance. That beat in that case is what got people to dance, not necessarily the vocals as much. So I put Marvin Gaye over it and did a couple little tricks to pitch shift it. And like, it just works. It just works. And there's something to be said though, about songs that we, we come to hate. Like, you know, there's a lot of people that are like hate, bo hated NSYNC back when they first started and hated all the boy bands and stuff like that. And like, you have something that's so predominant in our culture that gets played over and over and over again, that your brain keeps feeding it to you and while you hate it it becomes you like it through repetition and through nostalgia yeah. um but also the other great thing about that uh, other than you know you personally you know starting to like a song that you otherwise hated is the redeeming power of mashups is that it's just like you said you know it's got a really nice beat to it it's got really funky groove and you throw a, a competent vocalist over the top of it, give it a different context, and now this mashup is your favorite song, even though it contains something that you know used to be crappy. You know, but I'm not a you know. I don't even mean to say strong words like I hate that song. I literally hate nothing. Okay, I'm yeah, yeah, everything, and I'm just a learner and I'm an observer as to like, okay, this song's popular. Why? What is that element that makes it popular? And you know, as a, a as you just keep doing this as a DJ, you can recognize those aspects and be like, got it, you know? It's, and that's again, that what makes this song great is understanding the note changes or certain chord changes, like the music theory thing, understanding what it is that scientifically makes people like this song. And yeah, it's, it's a puzzle. A um, so yeah, Smoked Out Soul and I even, you know, I'm, they're, they're really good friends too. And I, I flew to Mexico last year and DJ Zeb's wedding, which, to me, it was a huge, you know, ego boost just to be trusted to do that because he's also a DJ and musician. And there were all these great musicians at this wedding in Mexico, a lot of festival uh, people that throw festivals, people in major bands and a lot of musical professionals. And so when I got there and they're like, Fox, man, can't wait to hear your set, bro. I know you're going to kill it. I was like, I am. <laughs> You know what I mean? I was very, very nervous. And then I did deliver and it was great. At the end of it, they were like, man, that was so cool. And that was very reassuring uh, to be around those types of people, to be trusted. And then again, have somebody else play your mashup. You know, those sorts of things mean a lot to me. And that, um, not the approval that has taken control, but the, the more of a group involvement. So instead of making these just crazy, weird, conceptual mashups, which I still will continue to make. I try to equally balance those out with crowd pleasers. Um, and, you know, especially now DJing more on Twitch with the Booty Crew, who, um, again, shameless self-promotion, may be DJing um, Friday 
from 3 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. happy hour, which would definitely incur um, playing more of my original Schiller jams. Uh, you know, so please, you know, follow Booty Mashup and follow me and, you know, I um, just I try to be as diverse as possible. And that's just because I need to be. I, I am equally influenced by all of these things, soul, funk, 80s, you know, I've you heard my 80s 45 set. I just love, I'm a music lover, and I love DJing and putting these songs together in a new order that may have not been heard. Um, yeah. There's just an endless source of influences, and I've been very thankful to be able to do this for a living for a long time. And now that I'm not making much money at all, you know, and I'm just doing it from my garage, basically, it's somehow inspiring me even more in this time because there's not really a lot of pressure. There are no gigs, right? Laszlo isn't open. Madrone, where we do Motown on Mondays, not open. You know, we pray that these will open again, of course. But in the meantime, can't stop creating, can't stop being myself. So thank God for Twitch because, you know, if, if we didn't have this platform right now, I'd just be pretty bored and kind of miserable because right. I might still DJ for fun. But it's almost like... You know, you do thrive on that, in this case, chat room and somebody being like, man, that was a dope mix. It's like, cool. Somebody heard that. And and you know, it also that. doesn't hurt the fact that, you know, subscriptions, if they subscribe to your channel and actually give the, you know, two four ninety nine or two ninety nine if you're an Amazon thing, that it actually helps maybe, you know, buy you a meal or whatever else like that. Right. And, right. You know, there there have been a few times and I mean, it's not much, but. People donate that tiny bit, and it just feels nice. Um, I had one friend from the East Coast. Of course, he would do this. Um, he didn't want to donate money. He instead would rather donate booze. So he had like $50 worth of uh, 40s delivered to my front door. Um, you know, That's which amazing. I since college, but I was like, you know what? That, just, that is a real booster right here just to have, um, you know, friends of mine that this twitch thing especially doing earlier sets has allowed my friends and family on the east coast to watch me these people have never seen me in a club and they will never and that's okay they live out there and they have families they're not coming here so it's yeah. been a, a nice nice thing to be able to broadcast these things um that i've been doing for this whole time but now my friends and extended family get to see it and they realize it's, you know, it's just, I'm really happy to be able to, to spread that joy and love. And I'm, I'm trying to like um, advocate like through this screen and through my garage of how much fun this is for me. And, uh, you know, that I really, it really means a lot when people watch and even just that, you know, $1 donation or that $140, uh, yeah. you know. Every dollar counts. When we're, when we're out of work, like you and I, you know, clubs are closed. We can't gather for, for parties. This is how we make our money. Like, yeah. you know, I'm, I put on shows like this and I do the, you know, the occasional booty mashup gig. I'm trying to do more stuff here on my channel. That's just DJing stuff as well. But yeah, any, any dollar count counts to help us keep going and keep doing this for, for yep. sure. Yeah. And even just the follows, um, that's just really cool. You know, if people are interested enough, it's, it's just kind of these little boosters, especially, you know, in a time like this. And if you're a, extrovert when it comes to like performing and stuff and that's what's something that you're used to doing this is tough this is tough so um having a shred of that in the garage and having some kind words here and there from viewers is it's a very nice it's it's just a nice thing to to have access to right now well i'm really proud to have you as a guest because i really think that your body of work and you as an artist really need to shine and need to be you know a little bit more uh, uh, you need more eyes on you. Uh, you need more ears listening to your stuff. I appreciate that. And I'm honored to be included in this series, you know, among the other greats that you've already interviewed. I'm, you know, I really appreciate it. And yeah. Well, I mean, again, fun. when we talk, we're talking about, when I say masters of mash, I'm talking about the groups of producers that really helped make this what it is. And your inclusion with booty mashup. I mean, you've been, your mashups have hit the their charts so many times that your your mashups are in most people's uh, uh, was it uh, their iTunes or their their crates or their digital crates or whatnot. They they more than likely can just go there and search and go. Oh wow, 
I had all these other mashups. I didn't know that this was the guy who did them. Because again, you you have very much stuck to being someone in San Francisco doing in-person gigs and not putting yourself out online. So a lot of people don't have that access to you. And I've, I've, I've shown other people kind of like that, like my friend uh, Stalio, who again... Uh, was part of that early UK bootleg scene, put out multiple mashup albums, you know, in the late, in that, that third wave period as well. And again, because even, even the people who consider themselves the center of the mashup scene, like the Adrianas, the McSleazies, the, you know, stuff like that, they, they have blind spots. They have, they, they, they have focused so heavily on the core culture, they've missed all of the side parts. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not yeah. saying in any way that Adriana missed out on you. If anything, you are part of that whole A and D, you know, early booty thing. Uh, that being said, again, uh, we have to wrap this up, unfortunately. Uh, but I do want to. I want to go out uh, highlighting something that we we skipped over, and that is that you and Carlo, for a very short period of time. Uh, performed together as a group called the Face Mashers. Face Wind up Mel- getting you written up in the the New or the Face Melters. Sorry, yeah. Face Melters uh, got written up in like the the New York Post. Got a whole bunch of uh, you know, was it a whole bunch of attention based off that one mashup, which was uh, Vanilla Ice meets uh, Kesha, uh, called yeah. Ice Ice TikTok. Uh, I wanted to leave uh, this segment with one of the few videos because, again, when we talk about like mashups, like a lot of like the video stuff gets pulled down for copyright reasons. A lot, again, uh, further really obscuring you. Say that again. Not the video. Well, I didn't find the video for it, but what I did find, and you're gonna love this because I'm not sure if you know about this. No, I don't know. Uh, uh, basically, there is a. Uh, there is a fundraiser that's been happening for like a decade plus uh, called, uh, hold on a second, let me see if I can find it. There it is. Called Desert Bus for Hope. And it's it's uh, a sketch comedy group called Loading Ready Run. And every year they, on YouTube and I think streaming on their own website, put on this, uh, this giant fundraiser to raise money for... Uh, either uh, disabled children or, or poor children. It basically is just meant to help uh, put gaming and interactive things uh, more into their education. And so once a year they get together and they play the worst video game uh, in the world, which was a, a video game put together by Penn and Teller originally for the Sega CD system, but never got released called, uh, called desert bus. And the whole premise of the desert bus oh, thing do, yeah, the the video game. The premise of the video game is that you're you're in the the like Death Valley or whatnot, the Nevada desert, and you're you're driving, I think, back and forth. It's an eight hour trip, and you're in a bus where the steering wheel is loose, and so you can't just let the game play itself because the bus slowly teeters off to one side or the other. So you have to be there to nudge it, and you get like a point for every like mile or something. Uh, but it's an eight hour one way and then eight hours back where you just all you're doing is driving a bus with nothing else and it just teeters to one side. It's a terrible game. Yeah, it sounds awful. But they play it, they play it for uh, a, a live on a stream and have kind of like a telethon with like all kinds of people dancing and doing all sorts of other stuff. Uh, your video, your, your not your video, your song, uh, Ice Ice TikTok has been featured like once a year for like the last six or seven years. I now know that. Where they have a dance off to it. And so I'm leaving this on, you know, you guys uh, in the audience again, please go to uh, foxsounds.net, download all of uh, DJ Fox or Fox Sounds's ma- mashups like as soon as you can because you need these mashups. Thank you. But I'll tell you right now, this one mashup that got you so much attention. I'm, I'm leading out. You'll see a little bit of them dancing. You, won't, unfortunately, won't be able to listen to it, Chris, but everybody else will be able to listen to it. I'll, I'll send you the link later. But uh, here we are. Again, Chris, thank you so much for being a guest. Thank you, Pimp Daddy Supreme. My yeah, pleasure. of course. This is great. Um, you know, thank you so much, and thanks for everybody watching and, uh, you know, listening to me blather on about about my, uh, you know, somewhat interesting life. I this hope. is you. It's very interesting. This is me. So... 
thank you so much. And, uh, you know, hope to see you all uh, on my stream. I'll be streaming probably later today, definitely tomorrow, um, and maybe Friday. So just follow the page if you want notifications. And, and man, thank you so much for all the kind words and, and um, you know, introspective questions. And it's really helped me kind of, you know, map out my trajectory and look at it from from years past and be like, you know, all right, I have done something of note. Yeah, of course you have. Not only that, but you're still active. So, I mean, we're I looking active. forward to more stuff. Might, might I recommend, uh, you know, with the Star Wars movies, they did all of those as prequels. You started your first mashup out compilation is uh, Mashup Album Volume 7, uh, or, you know, it was Volume 7 of your mashup compilations. Why not make the previous six as prequels? That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am experiencing a surge in creativity. So I just want to let everybody know that there is a lot more material coming. That's great. So and I'm going to leave you guys, uh, everybody in yeah. the audience, uh, stick around for just about one more minute. Because, uh, again, I'm going to play a, a snippet of uh, the Desert Bus for Hope uh, charity dancing to the face melters. Uh, again, see you next week at 2 p.m. Hopefully we won't have any... Uh, any technical difficulties so we'll actually stay on uh, our time trajectory stick around in the uh the chat room we're going to be raiding booty uh booty mashups the listening party with adriana a here in just a second but uh, again chris thank you so much thank you talk to you later i'm so happy right now <laughs> All right, stop to elaborate and listen. I sit back with a brand new invention. Something grabs a hold of me tightly. Flow like a hawk, daily and nightly. Will it ever stop? Yo, I don't know. Turn off the lights and I'll tell you. Do the extreme of my mic. I feel like I'm going to do it now. Stand to watch like a candle. I know I'm actually not going to break it. I'm going to do it now like a poisonous mind. Shake it very well, yeah. When I play a dope melody, anything less than the best is a felony. Love it or leave it. You better gain weight. You better get rules out of it. Don't play it. If there was a problem, yo, I'll solve it. Check out the hook while my DJ was on it.